Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 120, Engine Building. What do we mean by engine building and some of the best engine building games? I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. All right, tonight we're back from an unplanned break with a discussion on the board game mechanic of engine building, based on a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons. Along with that, we're going to highlight some of the best engine building games we've played. Moving into the review segment, we've got a newly released engine builder, which is Funfair from Great games publishing greater games great i'm messing that up great games publishing is that right yeah great games publishing (laughs) it's a theme park building game i don't know why i was thinking greater games great games publishing uh we wrap up with the bellhops tabletop segment where we talk about the games we played and i've got my first thoughts on wonder woman challenge of the amazons and i've got some plays of clank and i've started running my first rpg online i'm looking forward to hearing about that Welcome to the Suggestion Box. All right, here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First, we've got a comment from Alan on our Sorcerer reviews. I found Smash Up to be a great replacement for Magic the Gathering. I played Magic the Gathering for over 15 years and gave it up, and now, years later, Smash Up has been a mainstay. I'm hoping Sorcerer brings another ripple in our board game playing group. All right, before I go on, do we want to re-record the beginning? Because it's good games publishing. That's why it didn't sound right. I'm uh, like, great games publishing does not sound right. And I, it's me. I typoed it <laughs> in the thing. But I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Why does that not sound right? You want to do just that one thing and I'll do a copy paste? Yeah, you can do that. Either either way, and then we'll jump back down. We're, we're all over the place tonight. This is what happens when we take <laughs> two weeks off. We're professionals. The video will be a little wacky because I'm probably not going to cut it for the video, but whatever. Yeah, that's fine. This can stay in the video. You get some sausage making for the YouTube fans. All right, moving on to the review segment, we've got a newly released engine builder. That's Funfair from Good Games Publishing, a theme park building game. All right, now where are we at? All right. You did the smash up. All right, Uh, so we're going to the smash up comment? Yeah, you're you're answering. All right, so thanks for the comment, Alan. Uh, Personally, I think Sorcerer, is not only much closer in gameplay to Magic the Gathering, I just think it's a better game than Smash Up overall. Now, I realize I might be in the minority here. I know there are a lot of fans out there. It just wasn't a game for me. Now, where Smash Up does blow away Sorcerer, and in a way, Magic the Gathering, is playing with more than two people. That's something we both learned. Actually, all three of us learned that Sorcerer does not do well. Indeed. Definitely a two-player or two-group game. Now, Ken wrote to us with a question on our topic of great games designed by Canadians. Are there any board game manufacturers that actually manufacture in Canada? All right, there's only one that I know of, and that's Cardston Inc., which is in Quebec. Uh, They make cards, game boards, rule books, reference sheets, and paper products only. What I don't think they do is I don't think they have any complete games. Like you can't go to them and buy any games. I think they just make components for games. So if you want your cards published or or produced, you can get them produced here in Canada. Or if you want your rule book or your board, but I don't think you can get a whole game manufactured here. Now, one of the largest board game manufacturers in the entire world is Panda Games. Now their headquarters is here in Canada, but they do all of their production over in China. So I don't think they really count. They definitely don't manufacture here in Canada even though they are a Canadian company. And thanks for the question, Ken. Well, next two comments on our Back to the Future through uh, Dice Through Time review. Wayne Cole commented to say, I have a Back to the Future board game from IDW that I have never had the chance to play. (laughs) Even so, I'm tempted to get this too. And Dr. Ken Franklin, one of the designers of the game, writes... Thanks for your thoughtful comments. We poured a lot of love into this game and tried to balance attraction between hobby gamers and family gamers. Well, thanks for the comments, both Wayne and Ken. Um, I am sorry to say I haven't heard good things about the IDW Back to the Future games uh, or game. I think they, they might have two different ones, but I haven't heard anything good about that. Now, the one Back to the Future game I have heard good things about and the one I want to try next is the one from Funko and Prospero Hall. Um, I think that was just called Back to the Future Back in Time. Now, I also want to mention, I love the fact that 
Ken came in comment because I love it when a designer finds our content and takes the time to interact with it. And I got to say, if the goal of the, the game of Dice Through Time was to make it accessible, family weight game that will also appear to gamers, I think you and your team did a great job, Dr. Franklin. All right. Well, speaking of designers commenting on our content, Dave Killingsworth commented on our RoboCheck Force of Arms review with some interesting background information. Force of Arms, Macross, was meant to be a light entry point to our RoboCheck games. Then Crisis Point, Masters, has way more control and depth. And then Invid Invasions, the new generation, is a deep-themed cooperative game. You should love that one. The three-year plan we had was build the small, super light one, Force of Arms, to get people back to the IP and make it for $20 or less. Then Crisis Point was the ultimate expression of the mechanic, but heavier. Then Invid is the Beast. It's cooperative, and I think you will love that one. Theme sticks all over it, and the idea was to play three games in one night, and you played the series. Can't wait for you to try Invid. Well, thanks so much for your comments, Dave. Uh, I definitely saw the progression from Force of Arms to Crisis Points, and I totally get the reasoning behind this setup. Like, Especially the, the less than $20 entry point is a great idea especially with Robotech, the license being owned by the same company for so many years, getting people to realize that there is a new series of Robotech games out there, that's an important point. As for Invid Invasion, I've read the rules. Um, I have everything punched. I'm ready to play it. I'm hoping to get it to the table soon, maybe as early as next week. As for playing all three games in a row in one night, I don't know about that. That, that might be a bit too much Robotech card game for me in one night. But it does sound like it'd be great for like a con or something or some kind of tournament or set it up. Maybe when things turn to normal, I'll do a Robotech night at the FLDS and run through all three or something. It's a neat idea. I just can't see playing those three games in a row, but we'll see. Well, we're going to wrap up with a couple of comments on our best new discoveries of 2020 list. The Cardboard Kid at Cardboard underscore Kid on Twitter. Rally Man is so good. If you don't like modern crimes, maybe check out Chronicles of, Qu of Crime Noir, since you enjoyed 1400. Noir is the kid's and dad's personal favorite. Codenames Duet might be our favorite of the series. Mm -hmm. Some excellent games in this list. And Adam Stansberry wrote, Surprisingly, this isn't a bad list. Many party games, but then some meteor offerings in Jaws of the Lion. No mention of Lost Ruins of Arnak, Whistle Mountain, or Etherfield, uh, Etherfields, but solid nonetheless. Well, thanks for the comments, Cardboard Kid and Adam. Uh, surprisingly, not a bad list. Were you expecting a terrible list from us? I think that's just based on the number of game recommendation lists out there put out by people who have just a bunch of mass market games on them. So I'm glad we were able to impress you, Adam. Um, I got a, I, I tried Ruins of Arnak. That's a Czech Games edition. I, I basically begged them to send me a copy of that um, before the end of the year, and it just didn't happen. They basically said, we've got enough people talking about that already. Now, they did send us a couple other games, one of which we talked about last week, Letter Jam. So we do have some stuff from CG to check out, but not that particular game. Um, it does look good, though, I got to say. It. It's, I, I love most CG games. I don't think I played a bad one, and they tend to be on the heavier side, which I enjoy um whistle mountain that caught my eye i don't know much about it but i did enjoy whistle stop and this looks like more of a gamer's game a bit heavier than whistle stop so i'm looking forward to that now i'm sorry to say ether fields or ether fields i had if i've heard of it before today i forgot about it like i don't remember it at all so i took a quick glance at it on cool mini and it just looks like another one of those overproduced miniature filled Kickstarter games, like something that's out there to compete with Eric Lang's cool mini or not stuff. Uh, though I did notice it's got over an eight rating. So maybe it's worth another look, but I can see why I probably, if I'd seen that on Kickstarter, just skipped right by it. Now going back to um, Cardboard Kids comment, Chronicles of Quarm Noir. To be honest, to me, Noir is still modern to me. I don't know. I like to me, I still wrap that still wraps up with modern crime drama versus medieval noir to me. Like I realize it's set in the past, but it still feels modern. To Same me. century, 19, 19, you know, yeah. anything in the 20th or 21st century, skip that stuff. That's gotta be it. I guess I, I like, I guess noir appeals more, but like I've never been into the noir novels or anything like that, but maybe if it's a better game, I did hear that noir did introduce some new mechanics 
which are similar to the family that are in 1400 where you can talk to your family so that part of the game does sound better but as for setting i don't know to me british bobbies versus noir bob noir detectives it's all modern there's there's like, people are using pistols and people get murdered for, for i don't know it, it for whatever reason it just doesn't seem to, as cool to me as either sci-fi or fantasy there you go now as usual though we will drop links to these game suggestions we missed in the show notes that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Thanks to everyone who stops in and catches us live in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. All right, tonight we are going to be spending some time talking about engine building games and exactly what that means. What do we mean by engine building? After that discussion, we will be offering up a list of what I think are some of the best engine building games out there, at least the best I've played. Um, and what I've, as usual, when we do these kind of game recommendations, I want a couple things from fine folk in the lobby. One is I want to know what your favorite engine builder is or favorite engine builders, if you want to give us a top five or whatever, so we can compare it to ours. But I also want to know if there's any we missed, right? Are there, there engine building games we missed? And I want to know if you agree with our definition, because um, this is definitely up for debate. Not everyone agrees with... The definition we're going to talk about tonight and actually it may, but what I think an engine builder is now may evolve throughout the show. By the end of the show, I may change my mind and think something else as well. So we are going to be looking for that. So after we're done talking about it ourselves, we will be back to check with the chat room to see what you think. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from Patreon patron and indie game designer, Roger Malosh, who writes, Hello, Mo and Sean. I'm enjoying your show, especially when I can catch it live. I have a question about engine building games. What exactly is an engine building game? I hear of games like Wingspan, Race for the Galaxy, and Steam Time being described as engine builders. This makes sense because you gradually build up your tableau or player board, and the results accelerate through the synergies developed between the components as the game progresses. But this could be said for most games. Monopoly behaves this way, as do most games classified as economic games, like Crude or Acquire. Rail builders like Chicago Express and Martian Rails can also build up an economic engine as the game progresses. How do you and Sean define an engine builder? What are some of your favorites? Oh, thank you very much for the uh, the comment or question, I guess, Roger. Uh, this, I think, this is a great question, actually, and it does not have an easy answer. Uh, and it's definitely up for debate. Not everyone agrees on exactly what an engine builder is. So what I want to start with is, I don't remember when we did this. It was our first year we were recording this podcast. One of our, our more popular episodes and one of my most popular blog posts is our giant list of tabletop game mechanics, which I don't know how many mechanics is on it now, but it's a lot. And on there, one of the ones I featured is engine building. So to quote that, players need to build some form of system to score points. The system starts small, but grows as the game goes on. Scoring usually escalates as the game goes on as well. Actual ways this is done is through a combination of the other mechanics. So while I think that works, it's pretty broad. And as Roger noted, that could almost be applied to pretty much any game where you're scoring points, as long as you score more points later in the game than earlier. So I think we need to dive a bit deeper into this tonight to, to get into why we think certain games are engine builders and why we think others aren't and what classifies an engine building game, at least to us. Right. So, I mean, simply the, the, the most straightforward thing is an engine is a system designed to do work on your behalf. Like that is what an engine is, if we're getting right down to those roots. So an engine builder is building a system designed to do work on your behalf. Right. Uh, and so it's got to do something without you being involved, essentially. You need to start things rolling, but then the rest of it, to me, really kind of progresses on its own. Right. Um, and a better machine, better results. So a better engine, yeah, more chance of winning. Yeah, and that's where we get to the term uh, running your engine. So in a engine building game, you usually have built something that you can run, that you can get going, that you can let happen. Instead of having to do everything yourself, you run your engine to get your thing out of the end. So, um, so the main thing I think you need is that system, right? Something, combination of parts you put together through the game, usually starting small, I think always starting small, and then getting more. Now, more of what depends on the game. Like I, in one game, it's going to be resources. In another game, it's going to be victory points. It's probably all going to be victory points in the end, but you might be getting more resources that you can turn into victory points and other things. 
Another big part of most engine building games, well, actually I think probably all of them, is you're taking one thing and converting it to something else. And sometimes multiple times where you're gonna take the thing and you convert it into another thing and then you convert that into another thing and then eventually that turns into points. You're, you're starting some kind of chain reaction, a chain of events through various game mechanics or through various gameplay that are going to turn one thing into something big. And again, it starts small. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to have one link in the chain. And by the end of the game, you hopefully have this big pile of chains all interacting together, producing your points or your resources. So what we're looking at is like, at, at, you get A, right? So you start, you get this thing. And yeah, at, at turn one, you produce a, a basic resource. Well, then next turn, you can you build a new thing and you can turn your basic resources into something new. So your basic resource now becomes an advanced resource. And then once you have B, you can now get C, which is you could trade that resource in to turn it into a building because you have enough buildings now. And then you can trade in that building with other resources to build a bigger building or something like that, right? Like I, I, without mentioning specific games and game mechanics, you're slowly building on something small to something bigger and eventually getting it to give you whatever you need to win the game. Again, in most games, that's going to be points, but not necessarily. Some games, it could be the number of cards in your hand or it could be something else. And it's also possible, I mean, we talk about transforming, but it's also possible to transform from A to B and B to A again. So getting more A by passing yes. through B, essentially. Yep, um, yep. You don't necessarily have to have a C and a D, uh, and, and, and your final output is different than your initial input. It could all, it could, your, your final input, your final output and your initial input could be the same even if it passes through different steps along the way and different yep. different yeah. materials or whatever along the way so i think that the, the most important part to the me for a, a, a real engine builder is having a little and getting using that little to build more and then that little bit more lets you build even more which gets you more and it's that that, that progression of taking a little bit, getting more, and then by having more, you can get more of that thing and you just keep progressing up. So it's a, it's the, I remember someone described all Palladium role-playing games as big guys with guns, killing people to get bigger guns, to kill bigger guys with bigger guns, to get bigger guns, to get kill more. And, and that was a description of riffs from back yeah, in the day. That's and for some reason that riffs. sticks in my head, right? Like I, as an example of this, without bringing in a specific board game. You, you, you do SDC so you can get damage that does MDC. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So another thing that's important for an engine builder for this to actually work is the game has to have some form of permanence. You have to put something into play that can be stay there and be built on. Now, the best example of this, every as far as I, I can think of, maybe I'm missing one, every tableau that I've ever seen is an engine builder because you are putting cards in front of you, building your collective resources, your stuff that you can use, and you are going to, it stays in play and you build on it every round. You're adding more cards to your tableau. So this is going to fit all those games like Valeria Card Kingdoms and Race for the Galaxy and Puerto Rico and any game where you're putting a tableau in front of you, building upon it. These are also going to be games where you build chains or routes on a central board. So instead of just having a playing board, you're connecting things. So here's where uh, Richard, Richard, is that the right name? Roger, Roger thank you. Roger. Oh, I'm just off on names, but like they're close, but they're not there. Roger. I'm like, I know Roger personally. I shouldn't forget his name. Where Roger mentions the Empire Builder games. The Empire Builder games, if you make a chain of routes that work, then you are also doing that. So now here's an interesting uh, question that sort of breaks away from, from, your uh, some of your theories, but I think a lot of people would argue that it is an engine builder, and that's a deck builder where there isn't permanence necessarily. You're building there an engine so. that that it, it's permanent within your within your deck, yeah. but essentially you're rebuilding that engine, or you need to try and rebuild that engine every time you you're playing out a hand again. See, I think deck builders are engine builders. Some are going to have more engine building than others because your permanence is your deck. It's not yeah. a tableau in front of you, but it's your deck. It's the same thing if you're building up a game where you have a hand of cards and you keep the hands of your cards and you get new hands of cards and you eventually have more options. So example, like Gloomhaven is not an engine builder. Right. There, there is, there, the, your but, hand of cards is set at the start of the game. But Star, um, um, your favorite one, uh, Star... Star, Star Realms? Star Realms. Is an engine builder. Is an engine builder. <laughs> but the other thing, though, is some deck builders are more engine builders to others, which is going to get to my next point in a second, is I don't think Ascension is a good example of an engine builder. 
because Ascension in general, you just buy the most expensive card and you just play the most expensive card and you get some stuff and you buy stuff. And yeah, eventually you're going to get more cards that let you buy more stuff so you can buy those more expensive cards. So there is an aspect of it. But when you compare that to say Star Realms or a game where there's combos, where if you put in more yellow cards, yellow cards let you draw more cards. And for every yellow card you have, if you have another yellow card you've already played, they then go off of each other and let you get more stuff. So there's there's a reason to do it. Now, later games of Ascension that added in the events made it so there were reasons to collect similar colors. Yeah, I, the problem with Ascension, I think, because Ascension should be, even in the initial yeah. forms, it should be a deck builder. The problem is they they fell into that trap of expense equals yes. reward. So yeah. if you play it and ignore the, the fact that the most expensive card is the best, there are some really great engines you can build within the different suites. Yes. But then you'll lose because the other person is just buying the most expensive the card. The most every expensive, time. yeah. They, so the engines are there, but they don't benefit you as well as That's they much, should. Yes. See, so... So like deck builders, I would always just call deck builders, deck builders. And to me, that's a subset of engine building. But now to look at a different side of it, I don't think deck construction are engine builders. Magic the Gathering to me is not an engine builder. Now building your deck, you are building an engine into your deck, right? You are, you are putting your card combos, you're putting in your chains, you're putting in your mana burn, whatever, whatever system you're building into your deck. But to me, that's not an engine building game. That's something you, have, you do you before have built you your play. Engine. You, you have built, built your, your engine. engine. Yes. You're playing an engine, but you're not building it. You, you are an engine. running your engine. In Magic the Gathering, you're not building it. Right. So where that's where I think it's different, where deck building, you are building the engine as you play. Although so I, I, I would argue in newer Magic the Gathering uh, that I've had experience with playing online, there are some engine building things that are now possible. Um, and, 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 and you're setting up the table and you're building engines on the table. Uh, that have permanence. Yeah, but again, to me, that's you're running the engine. You built the engine ahead of time, and you got the right cards out at the time to get that engine to work. But yeah, to me, that's the difference. Again, I said this. This one's a broad one. This is a good time. Yeah. That's why I wanted it to be a discussion and not just here's what an engine builder is. <laughs> yeah, I, I the, the, some of the newer. I agree 100% with you in Magic the way we used to play. Some right. of the newer versions and some of the newer um, ways the cards are interacting feel like you're moving more towards uh, the engine building concept, even though right. the actual building is in some ways happening right. before the game starts. But I also agree with you at the beginning point where I'm not sure if deck builders really qualify. I wouldn't call, I, again, deck builders to me is a separate thing. It right. has an engine building aspect to it, but it's the fact that every round your cards are wiped. Right. Now, the permanence is not there. The permanence isn't there, right? So, you're hoping, and the random element's really high, you're hoping to get the right cards to get the thing to work. Now, if you can color your decks, you get more of that engine building feel, right? Like Star Realms, if you can get your deck down to 10 cards or five cards that you can just keep cycling to do those ridiculous amounts of damage, then that you've got a great engine in that game. But again, I don't think it's enough to really call them engine builders. Because right. to me, for a game to be an engine builder, that has to be the main thing you're doing. The game is about building an engine. It's all about building component parts together to create a system to get you the most of the thing you need to win. And not all games are engine builders. Like despite the fact Roger say all games are engine builders, <laughs> that everyone has some aspect of engine building. I actually disagree. I don't think every game is an engine builder. We'll get into some specific examples in a bit, but a lot of games have engine building aspects because well, it's part of the game. Like you're building a thing. You're trying to score more points. You're trying to do something you want. So I think a lot of games have engine building aspects, but what I want, like when I say a game's an engine builder, that's the main mechanic. That's the main thing you're trying to do. That's right. the, the feeling you get of building something to get you something more and having that thing a, you've a sense of construction a sense of I, I built something in the end of the game is very different from i drew a bunch of lines on a map or i played a bunch of cards yep now i also think it's important to note uh as i said this is a pretty divisive topic is this is not on board game geek you will not find engine builder their list of mechanisms they don't call them mechanics their list of mechanisms does not include engine building engine building is an aspect of play not a game mechanic that's intentionally put into a game. Right. It's and, something that evolves or happens. And, and I actually, I have to say, I kind of agree with this. To me, it is an application of mechanics. Yep. So um, deck building 
can lead to engine building mm -hmm. and, and the different, the different component mechanics that we talk about in, in, in various episodes and, and in various games can form an engine building system in the game, but it's those components working together to create your engine right. building application within the game uh, so much as it itself being a mechanic. Again, you, it's hard to define a mechanic as this thing that's built up of a whole bunch of other mechanics. Right. So it, it's more of a meta mechanic, so I guess. I guess that's fair. The thing is, I think it's a useful term when talking about the kind of games we like. Oh, absolutely. I, it's like, just whether or not it's a I mechanic. It's, 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 a, yeah. it's more of a type than a mechanic, perhaps? Possibly. I don't know. I Like, to me it's every mechanics is some of other mechanics put together in different ways, right? Like, like deck building is just a, a version of card drafting and it's a version of um, hand management. It's a version of resource management all thrown together using cards, right? right. Like yep. I, to me, I think there's enough games that have a very similar feel by having those same mechanics put together that I would call them all engine builders because they all use those same things put together. And I, I welcome Roger to the chat room. Right, absolutely. You're, you're joining in partway through your topic. You're going to have to listen to hear, hear the beginning again. Um, so moving on to the fact that definitely not all games are engine builders. There are, are some games that are very much just aren't in any way whatsoever. Uh, the first thing that came to mind, this is, actually goes back to another one of Roger's topics, is Euchre or traditional trick card game game taking games or ladder card games or pretty much every traditional card game like the cribbage and all of them uh and the gambling games they lack permanence right there's there's no engine every round is basically a standalone game every trick in euchre could be a standalone game who wins that trick then everything sets you again there's there's nothing there's no permanence there's no engine there's no you can't have a good euchre hand build on that for your next euchre hand it just doesn't work yep Another example are pretty much, I, I can't say all, but most abstract games. So your chess checkers go and modern equivalents, right? Sandrini, Onitama, Luke. Um, Azul is, is borderline because there is the whole scoring engine where if you build your tiles next to each other, again, I still think to be called an engine builder, you need to, it needs to be the, the main mechanic yeah. of the game. And it is most definitely uh, yeah, I not. Think, I think calling Azul an engine builder is, is a <laughs> That's stretch. really stretching it. Yeah, it's stretching it. it. It has, again, it has an engine building aspect yep. that you can get a point scoring combo going by building tiles in a certain order. So there is that small aspect of it. But again, in no way would I call it a, an engine builder. Um, and there are a number like this, we're talking about traditional card games and abstract games and, and roll and move games. Again, roll and move games. There's not let's, snakes and ladders or a million licensed board games that came out when Sean and I were kids. We're not engine builders. You rolled the dice, you did what happens, right? And then you rolled the dice and did it again. There, there was no way to build up an engine or even a strategy in those games. But it's not just old games. Like there are a number of hobby board games that don't have any engine building aspects as well. Uh, the one that came to my mind right away is Carcassonne. Like there, there's no engine building. You build the city or you build a road and you put your meeple on it. Like there, there's no way to run an engine. There's no way to look at the thing I did three turns ago, pay off now. Doesn't happen. Yep. So I think to me, if you're, if you're designing a game and again, I'm, I'm still not necessarily of the opinion that it is a specific mechanic, but if you are designing a game with the concept of engine uh, building in mind, it requires a different mindset and a, a set because you need your players to have a deeper knowledge of what is possible in the future. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what is possible, uh, how can you plan the initial stages of your engine? Right. So how can you lay down the groundwork for an engine if you have no idea what's coming in the future? Mm -hmm. um, so both the lack of knowledge and a high level of randomness can yes. impact the potential of engine building in the very design level of a game. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. Now, there are a number of games that have a small amount of engine building that I wouldn't call engine building, like even more than Azul. Like Azul is, is about as far as I'm willing to stretch. Um, so Roger mentioned Monopoly. Really, the only engine building you get is the houses and hotels, which, yes, it can be a big part of winning the game. It's a very small aspect of the game overall. Like, really, it's a roll and move trading and economic game with auctions that play properly that has a small engine building aspect. 
Like, it, and, and it's so random, the chance that you land on the right property and then lose all your money to another player. And I think the same is true for Catan. Though I did see Catan on a number of best engine building lists, and I, I disagree with this. Because while building multiple settlements or cities on a resource you need does lead to getting more of a resource, it's a small engine. I don't think it's a big enough part of the game to classify as an engine builder. And the other thing is there's no agency here. There, there's no, I can't choose to run that engine. It's, it's complete happenstance that I happen to get it. The actual engine working and running is based on luck. Players have to land on the right spot, the other players often, or the right number has to come up on the roll, on, on the resource dice. You don't get to choose to run the engine, which goes back to what we talked about right at the beginning. Sean mentioned about how it, uh, an, an engine by definition has to do something on its own. Right. And now I have to say, I, I do agree a little bit. I disagree with you on this one. I have to say Monopoly is at its very heart, an economic, economic engine builder. You, you, the, the goal is to buy properties, to develop properties. And as you go, so buying a property gives you income, which allows you to develop the property, which gives you greater income, which allows you to develop property further and greater income yeah. and so on and so forth. And, and yes, there is a randomness aspect, which reduces that, but Due to the fact that it's 2D6, the bell curve gives you more advanced knowledge uh, than a, a purely random game uh, in how to plan for it. And, you know, entire books have been written on strategies to take advantage oh, yeah. of um, where players are more likely to land than, than otherwise. Um, so I, I do have to say that as an economic uh, engine builder, Monopoly, to me, does hit all the the marks I don't, but you're not putting any parts together you're well, you not are. You're, you're building your it's 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 so you t again if we go back to that original uh definition we talked about at the beginning you're taking uh item a which is your initial seed money mm -hmm. you're you're turning that into property which is then turned back into cash which is then turned into buildings on your property which is then turned into cash which is then turned into yeah you definitely your there's definitely the escalation there's there's, there's um, that aspect of it so I, to me, it, it, it hits all those things. It is reduced in its effectiveness as an engine builder because of the randomness. Yeah. But I don't think that stops it from being, a, 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 it's just not a great engine builder because of the well, other problems with All the, the other problems with Monopoly, <laughs> yes. But, uh, but I, to me, it is, it, it, hits, it hits all the, the things, the checkboxes that we defined earlier on. All right, fair enough. All right, moving on from Monopoly, I was thinking most war games and miniature games. Like, I, 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 I can't think of any engine building in Warhammer 40K or, um, I, I don't know, Public of Rome or Fields of Glory. Like, I, I don't know. There are exceptions. Like, um, the one, one thing I can think of is if there's any type of forming, producing units, right? Getting more units out on the board. Those are sometimes tied to some form of engine. So Axis and Allies, you can build factories. Factories give you more points to put out more units. But again, that just is such a small part of Axis and Allies. Um, there are others similar to that. I think that, yeah. again, I, it's more on the, the war and the interaction and controlling areas than building an engine. Now, it's similarly risk. Now, one of the interesting things to me is, and this, this goes with these war games as well as some earlier mass market games that we're trying to capitalize, again, on the concept of Monopoly. Um, but one of the big things that, that differentiates to me is if you can have dramatic loss of engine, it's okay. not an engine builder. Uh, in Monopoly, once you get going, it, it, there's no there's no gotcha that, that blows away all your properties. Right. Whereas in a games like Risk, you know, all of a sudden you lose the country and you, you lose that function. Or there were a bunch of mass market games where you've, you've, you've developed something. Uh, there's a movie maker game that I like. Um, but you can go through all this time to build this engine of a movie that generates income for, for mm -hmm. you. But if you land on the wrong spot on the board, that whole thing is just gone. Uh, all right. of the blue. And to me that breaks it as an engine builder because yes, again, there's a little bit of engine building, but the fact that your engine can be thrown away in an instant right. stops it from being an engine building game. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was, I was about to mention myself because the more countries you own, the more units you get to produce. And then the more units you can produce, the more territories you can take over and so on. And you get that steamroller effect. But to me, again, it's, it's, you're only building on one thing too. There's no, there's no building. There's just, just, you just get more of the thing. And I think that's, I think that's where I'm missing in my discussion on Monopoly. 
is you're only, there's one aspect, there's, there's one piece and you're putting more pieces on. And I think for me to think of a good engine builder, at least, or what I want to call an engine builder game, you need options. You need more than one part you can pick from. So it's not just the progression of, I get more stuff, therefore I get more stuff. And I, because I have more stuff, I can get more stuff. It's the, you have an option. It's a, right. do I go for this or this? Do I add this piece on or that piece on? And I think that's the part that's missing from Risk, Axis, and Allies and Monopoly. Well, is, I, it's, it's, a, it's an engine, but it's built out of one part. Yeah, and I, I won't it's, deny it's that tower. Monopoly is a simple engine builder. But yeah. I still, it, I still think it fits our because of the definition we've reduced that definition yeah, yeah. down to its basics. We do hit it. Whereas risk, I would, I would argue less so. Again, because of that, I, the, again, permanence is one of those big things that we've yeah, talked the about over and over. Definitely gone. If if you if you're able to have your entire engine gone in a flash, it it it's not the engine builder game. It's just a tiny piece right. of engine builder. So another type of game that, again, don't feature um, very little, if any, engine building are your folk on the map, area, control area, majority games. Again, this is the risk kind of feel falls in here, too. It's a, a mashup between war games and area control. They're, they're like they're about building units, right? And the combat system is usually the focus, whether that combat system is dropping cubes in a tower or it's rolling a bunch of dice or it's card play. It's Oh, sometimes about finding combinations, right? Like attacking from the right spot or using the right set of cards at a time, but very few feature any form of engine building. And the one game that I was thinking of in my head was Cry Havoc being a, a Waro, right? A, a mashup of Euro game and and board game where there's definitely there's different armies and there's all these aspects and there's bits of deck building where you build up your deck. But like, I don't remember ever running an engine while playing at least feeling like i had an engine going I, I might get a combo off one turn or i might be able to capture some territory to do some lucky card play but i didn't feel like i had a, a war machine moving across the the army that was unstoppable because i built this perfect engine of cards and units it just didn't give me that feeling so yeah. I, again i think there's an aspect of putting thing, different things together to make something bigger that is missing from those games Yep. No, absolutely. And I mean, you look at something, you know, even a simplest, simplistic uh, miniature games like Blood Bowl, right? It's not an engine builder. And again, the dice are a big, the randomness yeah. is that huge, is a huge aspect that stops you. Even if you thought you could, you know, have these orcs move into this position and, and this and that, and then all of a sudden you roll the dice and so much for that. Yeah. So, so, so Roger in the chat room is mentioning route building can be a type of engine building. To me, it depends on the game. It depends on what you do with those routes. Can you run an engine? Or is it a race to get the longest route to the end or, or to get between the cities? So an example of that is I'll admit I have not played Empire Builder. I don't shame on me. It's a famous enough game and I even have a copy downstairs or any of the Crayon Rail games, but I look at Steam. In Steam, I'm connecting routes and the engine builds in the fact that at the beginning of the game, I only have trains that can go between two cities. And then later in the game, I build better trains and I can go more cities. But unless I can set up an engine where I'm going to produce red goods in this city and be able to run them through five routes to get the multiple points and do that multiple times, I'm gonna run more red. Now I'm gonna run more red. It's not much of an engine to me. Now Steam does have that. Steam has a way to repopulate route, uh, um, cubes in a city. And if you have a city, a, a combo basically set up where you have a bunch of routes connected in a certain pattern so that it's always five away and you can see ahead that there are three different ways to put red cubes on that city, your engine could be a red cube engine in, in Steam. So Steam has aspects of it. But I don't know if the crayon rail ones have that. I think it's just about you get the points. Like I don't know of a progression where, yes, you start off with a small route, you end up with something bigger. But I don't think any game where what you have grows necessarily means it's an engine builder. It has to do something. It has to, you have to be able to run it. You have to be able to, to do the thing the engine's built to do to get the end result. Again, usually being points. And someone did mention in the chat and I forget who now is, are there any games where it doesn't lead to points? And I often, I just feel like there is, but I can't think of a specific example. Well, I think a lot of times the, the, the question is, you know, what are you calling points? In Monopoly, you yes. call your points money. You know, you call your points dollars, but they're still victory points. Um, so... A lot of like eighteen XX games, I don't think of as engine building either, because it's all about manipulating the stock market, right? Like it's it's not about setting up a system of tracks and routes that generate you income every turn. Because if you do a really good one of those, someone buys you out your stocks and they're not yours anymore. Right. So you you, you lose that permanence again. Like Sean said, someone can go in and break it down and take it away from you. And I think that's one aspect. 
Now, I know we said we weren't going to go back to the chat until we got to the end of this, but I think it's worth going there now before we move on to some game recommendations. Is there anything else you saw in there? Uh, that, so uh, uh, that uh, people are wondering, you know, when we got, we got talking about deck builders there, um, is Harry Potter a deck builder? Uh, I, I, See, and that's I, again, it has it has some elements of it, but the biggest thing that's missing in that game is any way to tweak your deck until later with the later expansion. Right, and even in the, the later fact you can't tweak your engine, the fact yeah. you can't streamline your deck makes it a very if it is if anyone considers an engine building game. Again, I don't think it's about engine building. So right. to me, right then, it's not an engine builder. It's not about building an engine to defeat the bad guys, even though that's the goal of the game, but that's not what, really what you do with your deck. You're more, you're trying to protect your health and you're trying to buy some bigger cards to eventually, and you're also trying to remove the location things of whatever yeah. the doom marks. Like it, it's not it's, build an engine to do the most damage possible. And there's enough yes. random and there's enough randomness in it to really break engines pretty quickly. Yes. Uh, especially at the further into it you get. Um, I, I would say no, well, again, there are engine building aspects. It is not an engine builder. Um, and interestingly, uh, Ryan uh, says, I don't think Star Realms is an engine builder per se, a combo builder. Well, so again, there, that's it's, a, there's, it's, a, there's a different terminology, and, and I think I can understand that. Um, again, because there is no permanence in Star Realms. Right. See, again, it's the permanence of your deck. I think it's more of an engine builder than, say, Ascension. Because Absolutely. of that combo building. That's yeah. that was my argument at the time that it's more of an engine builder, but I still think deck builders are their own thing. Yeah. Now, now to make that an interesting conversation, we should bring up core worlds. Right. That's a deck builder where you build a tableau, but when you take over a planet, that tableau wipes and you right. have to keep rebuilding it. So is that an engine builder where you keep building engines and then they crumble and then you build them again? I actually think it is because there is no way at the beginning of the game you would have enough military strength or whatever the two types of military strength to ever take over a core world meanwhile by the end of the game you should have a deck that should be able to take multiple core worlds and as the game progresses and builds i think it actually has a lot of engine building aspects more than most deck builders right but again it doesn't have that permanence or it does because it's weird right like you have that whole <laughs> yeah you've got you, you attack permanence. a planet and you use up your resources right, and right. then they go back in so, your deck until so you you're 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 building an engine knowing that it's going to go away if it has done its job yeah and actually there that's actually a totally different look at it most engine building games i'm thinking of you build one engine and it lasts the whole game that you start at turn one with something small and at turn 10 the end of the game you have something big right i that actually doesn't always fit for all games because I, I think I'm thinking, it's valid that a type of engine building yeah. would be to build something, use it, and then build something again. Because I'm thinking, uh, my, my, my thought goes to the DC deck building game where, you know, if you've built your engine your, of your deck correctly, you know, you're not stuck with five cards. You're going to get through 25 cards or even your whole yeah, deck keep... in order to defeat the bad guy. And, and, and then next round, there's a new bad guy up and you've got to hope your cards come up in the right order to... Right. build the full deck out completely or build your engine out completely to defeat the bad guy again and watch your opponent cry. Um. No, no, exactly. That, what, that's why I'm like, I want to yeah. say deck builders are engine builders. I just don't think they all are. Again, they're like, a, when you can get different. that perfectly tuned deck where you draw your entire deck in one hand, like star realms. I've done it many yep, times yep. using the red cards where you can draw your entire deck every round and do whatever by 50 points of damage in one round and then you're like all right it's your turn now it's my turn again oh draw 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 oops my whole deck again 50 points that's an engine right like you managed to fine-tune your deck to a point where it can work and, and this is where we get into the problem i think the board game geek had and why it's not included is because this is so meta again we're well, yeah. describing the use of other mechanics, mechanics yes. into a system that is either a, a one engine builder or a multiple, you know, repeated engine builder, or again, it, it's this meta use mm -hmm. of mechanics into a system that we define as an engine builder, but is an overarching yeah. concept. So I, I still, I, I think the term's valid. I think it's useful to talk about. Now I will say every game that we're going to get to in the recommendations is a start small, build big. You don't lose it halfway through. Because I didn't even think of that until the talking about core worlds being an example of one where you build your engine, use it, and then have to build a new one. Right. Which is, a, a, I think, a really interesting use of, I guess we call it engine building. Yeah. I don't know. To me, it's still... <sighs> I, I, it definitely doesn't apply to every game. Every game is not an engine building. Not every game is about an escalation of getting more of a thing. 
Like, I think that's part of it. It's an, it's an escalation from the beginning to the end. It's not, you're going to try to to be as efficient as possible and get the most out of say 10 points every turn. And you're going to get seven this round and nine next round and six next round. It never goes up, right? That's, that's your standard game is you're trying to do the thing to get you what you're going to win over and over and over again. Whereas an engine builder is I'm going to get five points. I'm going to get 10 points. I'm going to get 30 points. I'm going to get 90 points. I'm going to get 120 points. Uh, a great example of one that I didn't put on the list. I'm going to mention here is power grid. If you look at your income and power grid as you play through it's a great example of the feel of an engine builder that you start off the game and you run your one power plant and you make your big seven dollars woohoo and then the last round you got seven to twelve different plants up and you get all this money and but the interesting part about power grid is the money means nothing you actually get points you actually win based on how many powered cities you have which is why it's such a, a popular game is yes, you can build that economic engine, but unless you're using it to build power plants, it doesn't matter. Right. So I don't know. Let's, let's see if we can summarize it all. So <laughs> what, what, do we have a, a summary on here? So you start off small, you build big, you have, it has to be able to run on its own. I think that was part of it. Yeah. And I think and, and permanence, permanence, whether or not, whether or not it, it it's, Temporary permanence or repeatable permanence. I think we're just going to stick to, to, to permanent permanence. Like yeah. the repeatable, I think is an exception. I think, right. So, I think, so, like so, said, so we're pushing deck. We're, we're pushing the deck world, the deck builders off to the side yeah, as their own a branch branch. Right. They're a brand. Like, again, there are many games that have engine building aspects that I wouldn't call engine builders. Now, an example is, is uh, dominion is very much about, building an engine with your deck to buy more cards to get those victory point cards right. because it's it's a very different style it's, it's closer to engine building than most deck builders that progressed after it which tried to throw in themes and multiple resources and combos and other stuff whereas dominion on its own is all about buying the most and, and know what i think changes too it doesn't have the variable market you right. are presented it's what you talked about how one of the things you need for an engine builder knowledge. is knowledge of the future like knowledge of what's going to score you points or what's going to come up where dominion has that whereas star realms ascension core worlds none of those have that right dominion it's 10 cards are up at the start of the game those are the 10 cards you have to use every game and use those cards to make the most efficient engine you can right so i know i'm, I'm contradicting some of the stuff we said <laughs> earlier in a way so there's a scale of engine building and every game is somewhere on that scale i think is is probably the best way to look at it there we go all right. Well, all right. So I think that's enough about games that are, are, are not engine builders and may not be engine builders. Here are some games, great games, in my opinion, that to me, most definitely are engine builders. Now, as usual, this for us, this list is in no particular order. And it might be. I, I think I rated them by complexity, but I didn't want to like come out and say these <laughs> are rated by complexity. But I did that as I was going through because I had some... Um, synergies between a couple of these in a row so the one i'm going to start off with it is not my favorite game uh people have heard me complain about it now and then and that is splendor i just think splendor needs to be on this list because it is the perfect example of a very pure engine builder it's an abstract gateway engine building game you're gonna use gems to buy cards that give you free gems that are gonna let you buy more cards that will give you more free gems to eventually let you buy better cards to give you points and maybe you'll get to the right combination of gems to get a bonus scoring point to a noble card i it it's literally is like the most basic definition of an engine builder start small Yep. get the cards to build your engine run your engine to get the stuff that gives you points yeah and so you're 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 transferring uh materials from from a to b and you have permanence no one can no one can destroy your engine as you go Correct. uh and it it does it builds from nothing to you know the be the best at the end yeah uh, and that was splendor Next, I have Gizmos. This, to me, is a, a better example of an engine building game to me because the theme ties in with Gizmos, right? It really is an engine builder. This is, this is you are at a science fair. You're trying to build a science fair project piece by piece, um, attempting to build a Rube Goldberg-like style engine that you hope will eventually become this thing that makes you a ton of points. Um, 
you hope each piece you add to your gizmo is part of a big chain reaction because you have things like, okay, because I grabbed a yellow energy, I get to pick another energy. And because the second one I picked is red, I can build a red card for free. And when I build a red card for free, I get to file a card away. And when I file a card away, I get five points, right? Like that's the, the whole game. And it, to me, this is a great way to go. When someone goes, what's an engine builder? I'm like, here, sit down and play gizmos. And I'll show you like the, the, the purity of an engine builder. And uh, the one nice thing about gizmos is while there is an aspect of randomness in the marble drop, because of the um, stack of uh, marbles that you can see, that reduces the randomness out. And I need to pause for a second because my yeah, GPS what is, is beeping. That? <laughs> I'm like, I am hearing a really unique sound. It sounded like someone scratching on ceramic. My my UPS is is on its last legs, and I haven't replaced it. So uh -huh. every once in a while, the battery goes off, uh, alarm goes off. But yeah, no. So the Gizmos is great because it reduces that randomness. There is randomness to it, which makes it yeah. Well, there's know, the marbles plus there's which which pieces come out each but, round. But but there's because you can see the stack of marbles. You know, however many four or five marbles it is in advance. Um, you 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 know a certain amount of the future, even though the, mm -hmm. the distant future is unknown, you do get a little peek into the future there to to plan with. Yeah, and you can see what other cards are up in the in the market too to see yeah. what level two and level three cards you might eventually want to buy. Yep. And that was Gizmos. All right. If you like Gizmos, you've tried Gizmos, you like it, you're a hobby gamer, you've got that game down. Steamworks is what I would recommend next as the advanced version of Gizmos. This is another pure engine building game where you are literally building a machine to score points in front of you. Every round for our plants and components that come up on a central market and it's set up like a conveyor belt, right? Like stuff comes in on the right, comes up on the left. You're going to have stuff from that and you're going to use them to build machines in your own tableau. And these are like puzzle fit pieces that literally put together and every new machine you have becomes a new worker placement spot that can be used by all of the players in future turns and then round after round your machines grow and do more things and it might be that you put a worker here you get to choose the resource and when you choose the resource a thing happens like this is the very definition of engine building where you are literally building little machines to get you things in the game including scoring points it is a, is a definitely a step above gizmos for complexity but a very well done game where you are like the theme is so tied like you are building engines in in this game and that was steamworks all right up next i've got terraforming mars uh this is the game on the list i personally played the most often at least in the last few years there is one more i probably played more over time um well you can play terraforming mars without trying to build an engine you could just buy whatever cards happen to come up, whatever ones you can afford, or you could stick to all um, core projects and never build any of the, the, the cards from your hand. The key to actually playing Terraforming Mars well is to find the synergies between the various project cards and build an engine out of what you're dealt. Now, where Terraforming Mars really shines is the variety and number of these potential engines created from these cards. Are you going to collect microbes and animals? Or are you going to and keep putting little cubes on your cards that'll score a ton of points at the end of the game? Or are you going to just keep, try to generate plants and put forests all over the whole planet? Or are you going to try to get your terraforming rating up as quick as possible so you'll have enough money that you don't even have to worry about anything and just buy those big point cards by the end of the game? Like there are uh, probably an infinite number of potential engines in this game with the number of cards that are in it. And see, interestingly, one of the reasons I'm not great at Terraforming Mars is having not played it enough, I don't have the level of knowledge of the future that mm -hmm. you and D have. So I struggle to think when I'm looking at, you know, especially even that drafting, when you're drafting those initial cards, trying to think about all the possible things that do yeah. exist that can be done later. I, I can't necessarily play, uh, remember them all or think of them all or right. know them all. So it is more difficult as a newer player or a player who mm -hmm. isn't as familiar with the game to really get a strong enough engine compared to people who are, you know, intimately familiar with the, with the game. Yeah. This is a problem actually when you first teach the game is people are always looking at their hand of cards and like, well, what are microbe cubes for? 
what 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 do I want these plants for? And I'm like, well, just wait, you'll see it. Like uh, you can't really explain it ahead of time. Yep. It's like well, you're gonna have to see it because there're gonna be other cards that use those things, especially some of the early card. Well, the cheap cards that are like put a microbe on this card and it does nothing. It just collects microbes. Or the ones that are like move a microbe from this card to another card and you're like, why would I want to do that? And I'm just kind of like, until you played, you're just kind of like, well, just wait and see. Maybe yeah. you'll see it because maybe you'll do it. that is also why I do recommend though we don't even do it all the time is if you do play terror from march you should use the drafting variant where because then it's easier to build those engines because you're going to see more different cards and it reduces that random factor which we said before hurts engine building games because if they're too random you you're, you can't build an engine because you don't get the cards you want which right. is, I will admit, even with drafting, a problem in Terraforming Mars. You may decide you are going to build titanium and build spaceships and that's it and never see another titanium or spaceship card for the rest of the game. It happens. That is an aspect of that game. And that was Terraforming Mars. All right, I mentioned Terraforming Mars being my most played game. Now, again, that's in recent times. I play Terraforming Mars a lot. Before that, though was Race for the Galaxy. That is by far my most played game of all times with over 200 plays. Um, this again, similar to Terraform Mars, building an engine in Race for the Galaxy is not necessary. You could just build random planets or build random discovery cards and build the ones that are worth the most points. Having some form of engine is pretty much required to win. Now, this engine could be to slowly build up military strength so that you start with one military strength and you conquer a one world, which gives you two more military strength. So then you conquer a three, which gives you more military strength, but you conquer a five and so on. Or it could be collecting luxury good planets, blue ones, and setting up an engine to produce, sell, and consume those goods over and over. While not having nearly the amount of options to terraform Mars, one of the best parts about Race for the Galaxy, though, is the number of different engines you can attempt to build. And the difficulty in that game, playing it well, especially having played so many times, is starting off the beginning and deciding where to go. What what engine to even go with? Well, and again, the, one of the, the faults of Race for the Galaxy, not that I, I have any complaints about it, is the randomness, right? You yeah. could start on a military strategy and then never get a military card. It's unlikely, but yeah. not impossible. Yeah, and that's where that Explore Plus 5 no one actually likes to do actually comes in handy. <laughs> but yeah. again, like you complained about Terraforming Mars, or complained being a strong word, is you need to know the cards. You need yep. to know what to plan for in Race for the Galaxy. Otherwise, you're like, oh, I got this awesome yellow card. I'm going to build it. Well, aliens are kind of rare, and they're hard to build, and you can't use things that reduce the terraforming rating to build them easier. And if you don't know that, you could very easily start off going, I'm going to go all aliens and get messed up because you can't. And that was... Race for the Galaxy. All right, next I've got Fleet. This is an engine building game about building a fishing fleet. You start off with one simple boat and a contract to catch one type of fish. By the end of the game, you're going to have an entire fleet of ships and a number of different contracts. What I really like about this is, besides having one of the best auction mechanics in the game stolen from Power Grid, is the great decision points in this game. Whether when, when the contract auction comes up and do you do you double down? Because if you have multiples of the same contract, they get better. So do you want to specialize in one type of fish or do you want to diversify? Which ships to sail and which to keep for money because it uses multi-use cards. Again, this is taken from Race for the Galaxy or San Juan where you're using the same cards to put ships into play as you're using to pay for other ships so we're trying to decide what to do with that like this is one every time i read about fleet or see it i'm like man i gotta get fleet back to the table like i was so impressed by this game when i first played it and i just it doesn't get to the table very often and i need to get it out it's on the it's in the stack behind me I'm like, man i gotta play fleet maybe maybe this weekend just it's been too long great engine building game with of all things a fishing theme and that was fleet Next, I have St. Petersburg. This is a Russian nobility uh, in the city of St. Petersburg themed game that has a great slow ramp up from start to finish. You're going to start with just one or maybe two workers who are going to generate you a bit of money. You're going to use that money to buy some buildings probably that'll generate you a little bit more money, but make sure to save some to buy some more farmers the next round. Uh, or you could hire some nobles. Or in the second edition of the game, which I actually do recommend, start setting up some trade routes. And then again, by the end of the game, you've got this tableau filled with workers, a whole bunch of workers bringing you tons of rubies in, ruples, sorry. you got a city's worth of buildings, a full house of aristocracy, and probably a very diverse market if playing with the expansion. And hopefully all of this is working together to generate you points by the end of the game. 
And what I like in this one is unlike we talked about earlier games earlier where you, you re you lose your engine and it falls apart and you have to rebuild it. You have to change your engine because generally about midway through the game, you have to switch from trying to generate income to switching to generate points instead. And one of the things you can do in this game is you can replace buildings by building over top of them and you get a discount, right, for doing it. So you kind of shift your engine from doing one thing to another and deciding when to do that is such a big part of this game. Yeah, no, it's uh, changing gears is something we never really talked about in our definition, but that's definitely um, an aspect of something to do. And in this one, uh, like many of the games where changing gears is an issue, it's all about timing. You don't want to change too soon or your point engine isn't enough to, to push your, you know, cash engine or your cash engine isn't enough to push your point engine across the finish line, or you've gone too late and you've, you know, you're, you're, you, the changeover doesn't happen fast enough. Right. And again, you you haven't ramped up fast enough. You either peter off or don't ramp up fast enough. And that is St. <laughs> Petersburg. You peter off in St. Petersburg. <laughs> Uh, next, I've got Keyflower. Now, this one features a number, a large number of integrated and interlocking mechanics. Um, it includes worker placement and auctions and drafting and tile placement and tile laying. And, but one of the most important things in this game, by the end of the game, is figuring out some form of engine that lets you upgrade the tiles you've already purchased in your area and flip them over, and then getting your resources from your resource generation tiles to your storage tiles. And hopefully those are upgraded versions because they score a lot of points. Now, one of the problems with this game is that this requirement to build an engine isn't obvious the first time you play. You're like, yeah, I'm going to get forest because they produce wood. I don't know why I want wood, but now I want wood. You don't see until round three that you can build the storage shed that scores one victory point for every two wood that's in it. Plus, it's easy to get distracted just trying to like build the biggest territory because a big part of the game is auctions to get these territories. And you feel like you want to build the biggest thing or you want to have the most meeple for your auctions. You may not notice where the actual end game points come from, which has to do with having upgraded tiles and having resources in, in the right place. What I do like, though, is the slow progression of complexity in this one, where, again, you're starting off with you have one tile in the first round, you're going to draft maybe one or two more, and your number of options are fairly limited, and then they grow as the game goes on, as they do in all of these engine building games. And that was Keyflower. Next, I have a game that I felt I had to put on the list for Sean's sake, <laughs> if nothing else, and that is Pulsar 2849. Now, this has a few different engine building aspects in this sci-fi Euro game. And I don't even know, like, like there are engine building aspects and I think you call it an engine builder, but it's much more dice drafting and stuff like that. But there are so many different engines you can work on in this game. Like the, the most obvious is claiming, building and spinning up gyro dimes, right? That's your, one of your main ways to get points in this game. You're, you, there's a three-step process. You have to go claim one, then you have to build one, then you have to spin it up. You definitely have an engine going there. And if you do it early in the game, your points are just going to keep uh, accumulating as the game goes on. But then there's also the tech tree, which is randomized every game. And combining that tech tree with the HQ boards, the player boards, to do some other scoring system. And I say some other, because there's other lots of ways to do it. So like one of them is let you move, explore faster on the board. Well, if you combo that with your HQ board, where you do what they call the gate runs, where you go through a bunch of the same colored gates to get points, right? So you can kind of sit that engine up. Or it could be, using the array system pretty much the entire array system is an engine system where you are building components to generate something now arrays can generate points or you could use them to make technology cubes and technology cubes could be a way to get you bonus dice actions or they could be for end game scoring right like there's just so many different things and like like the other games on this list the best part about this is that none of these systems are objectively better than the other like you're gonna win if you do arrays or you're gonna win if you spin up gyrodyne it's not like that it's all about figuring out what works best based on especially what the other players are doing yeah no i this one this one is fantastic because they really are you know some games it's like oh well, i could do this or i could do this but i've seen people try this tech this path in other games and i've never seen anyone win the game with it whereas in this game they're all pretty much viable techniques depending on your board and the technology tree that day yeah. and, and what and dice so, are up and, yeah and so on yeah. and so forth um so again there is an aspect of randomness uh, but if things aren't breaking, there is permanence, and uh, that is Pulsar 2849. 
Up next is one of my favorite games on the list. If I just want to play a, a heavier engine building game, that is Russian Railroads. Because I got to say, what's a better theme for engine building than building engines, railroad engines, and the tracks they run on? Uh, this is not a route building game at all. This is just an abstract game that is, I, in my opinion, my favorite, the best pure engine building game on this list, where you start off with almost nothing and end up with a lot. This is a game where literally in turn one, you're like lucky if you scored eight points. Like most people are going to get three to five. And then the last round, people are going to score 230 points in one round. Like that progression from eight to 200 in eight rounds of play. I love that feel of that game. It's all about upgrading your stuff to generate your more points. There's three different railroads to upgrade. And then you're changing the technology of the railroads and you're converting them over from brass to copper. To, I don't even remember the different types. There's like six different steps and upgrading your engines so they can travel farther. You're going to build factories that increase your score output. It's all about building these various parts just to make you more points. That's the goal. Every round, you want to make more points than last round and hopefully more points than everyone else. Of all the games on the list, this is the one to me that has the most satisfying feeling of having built something in the end. Like, even if I don't win, it's like, oh, that last turn, I made 380 points. I just feel like I did something. I built something and I got rewarded for doing it. And that is Russian Railroads. And bonus points if you can find the German Railroads expansion, which just adds even more options to the game. <laughs> Finally, I am going to finish off with the heaviest, meatiest, mathiest game on the list. No, this isn't Power Grid. Uh, this is Arkwright. This is, as far as I know, probably the heaviest engine building game out there on all complexity and weight scales. Uh, Food Chain Magnet might be up there too, but I personally found Arkwright more brain burning. Uh, the, the, what I like about this and why I wanted to put it on the list is for a sense of scale where you can compare a game like Splendor that I can teach you to play in five minutes to a game like Arkwright, where the last time I played, people had calculators out and were taking notes to make sure that they didn't mess up their economics on the last turn. You start this game off, this is a uh, turn of the century, the invention of automation with the spinning Jenny. You start with one warehouse and one machine and two workers that can produce one good, and you end up building a manufacturing empire. This is a game with a ton of hard decisions to make, um, ranging from whether to stick with only one or two warehouses and good types or diversify into all four different types, how many workers to hire, how many goods to produce. You want to meet demand, but you don't want to have more than demand because then your products go to waste. Do you replace your workers with automation? It's a high cost to do so, but are you going to make the money back by not paying wages? Or right now where everyone's automating, so there's workers available everywhere because everyone's out of work, so everyone's cheap. Like This is a beast, but in my opinion, worth learning if you're into heavier games. And that was Arkwright. All right. As we've done in probably for the last year or so, when we do these lists, we are going to throw in a few honorable mentions. I got five of them tonight. And I think I'll mention why when I get to each game. So we got five honorable mentions tonight that are great engine builder games, but didn't fit on my main list for one reason or another. Number one is a game that anyone who's been paying any attention to board games for the last year and a half has heard of, and that is Wingspan. I don't think you can have a list of engine building games without mentioning this big hit. Um, I don't own it. That's the whole reason it's on the list. I haven't gotten to try it. Uh, before we started locking down for COVID, it was already almost impossible to find. It does seem like uh, Stonemeyer's put up with production that you can get the game pretty regularly now. Uh, the problem I have with this game, oh, it's not necessarily a problem, is it seems light. It seems it's going to be at that Splendor level, maybe a step above. And I worry for me, it's going to be too light to be enjoyable to play often. So it's not one I'm going to go to my local game store and pick up without having to play it. So that's a try before I buy for me. I want to play Wingspan. It probably belongs on this list. I probably love it. Maybe it's a better gateway than Splendor. I just don't know. I haven't done it myself. And I can't deny the number of other people who love this game. So, And that is Wingspan. Now, another huge hit of last year is Everdell. Everyone keeps talking about Everdell. Every single, when you Google best worker player, or best engine building game, if as long as the, the, the post you're looking at is from 2019 or newer, you're going to have Everdell on here. Based on everything I've read, I'm pretty sure I'll love this one. Like this is one, this was on my wish list. I, I would have, I, I 
if I had the spare money, I might buy this site unseen if I didn't have a pile of games to play already. Uh, the table presence. Man, does this game look good. The card design. The fact there's a tree that goes up on the table to hold the cards. I've seen some great looking 3D component upgrades. I have heard so many good things about Everdell. And well, it's a tableau builder, right? So I'm sure this has tons of engine building aspects. Not having played up myself. I couldn't put it on this list, but like I said, it's on everyone else's engine building hot list. So everyone else in the world recommends Everdell's. <laughs> and that was Everdell. Next, I've got Underwater Cities. Um, I've mentioned this one before. As a game, people tell me kills Terraforming Mars. And while everyone knows how much I love Terraforming Mars, so the game that kills, it's got to be good, right? I just haven't had a chance to play it. I have been at events where friends, I've sat down at the table and had the game taught to me, but then had to leave because I was hosting the event and some new gamers showed up and I got them hooked up with something else. So like, I just haven't had a chance to play it. So I was going to buy this. I'm like, I'm done. I'm going to buy Underwater Cities. I, I keep hearing about it. It's going to be good. Well, Rio Grande Games used to publish it. They lost the license or sold it, I don't know, to Capstone Games. And for at least three months there, when I had the budget and ability to buy it, it was out of print. And yes, I know I can now get it from Capstone, but I got a bunch of games for my birthday and it just, it's in there. I am going to apply this one sometime. I have to do it. So the next time I have spare budget and time to play a new game, Underwater Cities is way up there on my wish list, but haven't played it myself. Couldn't tell you. And that was Underwater Cities. All right. Fantastic Factories. I know nothing about this game. Like I literally had never heard of it. I saw the cover. The cover doesn't stick out much to me. It just looks like it reminds me of power grid, which I like. So I guess I should like it, but this one suddenly showed up on like everyone's best of 2020 list like that. Everyone's like, Oh man, did you play fantastic factories? And like, this was one of Tom Vassell's best games. And he said, it's one of the best engine builders he's ever built. So I took a quick look at it. Like I'm board game geek in that know what it sounds like is a slimmed down, streamlined, accessible version of Arkwright. It's all about building factories and making the most money from your factories. And I got to say, it looks cool. Um, that's about all I know about this one. This is, this is one I'd, I'd love to have a demo night. I could show up and try it out or something like that because I don't know much more. But definitely well regarded by um, a number of uh, board game influencers, I guess we'll call them. <laughs> and that is Fantastic Factories. And finally, I have Le Havre. One of the things we talked about with engine building and one of the things we think is key to engine building, we both agreed on this, is taking something and turning it into something else. And there is no other game that exemplifies this better, in my opinion, than Uwe Rosenberg's classic Le Havre. This is considered by many people to be Uwe's best game ever made. I own this one. It's in the pile behind here. I just traded for it late last year. I am looking forward to sitting down and playing it myself. I admit I did play this once, but it was at a public play event and there were player problems, we'll just say. And I didn't get to enjoy the game due to do the player issues during the game, but it's all about getting the goods and upgrading the goods and changing them from one type of good to another good to eventually sell them to get victory points and tons of components. It's uh, La Havre is the port and it represents a port in Germany. Everyone loves this game. I am really looking forward to playing it, hoping that it's up there with your Agricola's and your Caverna's and other Uwe greats. And that was La Havre. And that's it for our discussion on engine building. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. Uh, we've had a bunch of uh, chat going in there, look, going on. and uh, All right, so so what were the favorite engine building games? I know Pennywise dropped their list right at the start of the chat. We're going to screw back. So I want to know, what's everyone's favorite? Now that you know our definition of engine builder, two <laughs> things. One, are we wrong? And two, what are your favorite engine builders? Uh, so the first, the f top five for Pennywise are number one, Wingspan. Number two, Terraforming yep. Mars. Okay. Number three, Century Golem Edition. Okay, Kill so Splendor. Century, yeah, it's Century Golem Edition to me is an evolution. It's, it's Splendor with a new theme. I do prefer it to Splendor slightly, but it wasn't enough better for me to buy because I own Splendor. I found they felt very similar. What I was really curious about is they then released two other games in the series that you can play together so that one affects the other. That sounded really cool, but I was waiting for all the games to come out and then COVID hit, so. Right. Uh, number four is Gizmos, just not yeah. at two players. Okay. Uh, and uh, number five is, uh, I'll have to think about, not sure yet. So okay. I don't know. He may have come up with something. Uh, may have come up with something. That, but uh, uh, Trotorama mentions uh, engine building. 
Kanban, uh, Kanban, you are literally building cars. You are literally <laughs> building engines. I, to be honest, I don't think there's actually a lot of engine building in Kanban. I've, I've, you know what? It's been so long since I played that. If I remember, Kanban, you go to different spots on the board to do different things, but I don't think there's any tableau or building up. Uh, and here we it's go. It's a really from, solid game. And in the chat room, Pennywise says Everdell is the number five. Fair. Totally fair. So, you got anyone else? Deanna? What are your favorite engine builders? Um, so Engine building plus pushing your luck, Steampunk Rally. I could see that. Steampunk Rally looked really good. All about building your ship, and there are some push your luck aspects. I haven't personally played that one. Like, there are definitely more like yeah. the, and, than, and Pennywise, than what we listed. Pennywise is mentioning, you know, engine building should have minimal luck. Uh, and I yes. agree. Uh, if Or there should be ways of, of dealing with luck or, or you know, shaping shaping that sort of luck if there is luck involved um but again you need to know what's happening uh, so roger mentions viticulture that one i consider putting on the list right uh viticulture definitely got your your build up especially when you're you you start adding stuff right you have your vineyard and you start adding various things to it that starts making better and better wine and again the wine you produce in that last round is going to be way more than the previous rounds interestingly though I don't know if I would consider Vinhos as much. In a way, you're, you're like, yeah, you're still doing the same things. You're, you're, you're yeah. It has some aspects, but yeah. again, I don't, I, I don't feel like I've run an engine. Right. Even when I'm going to the last fair of the year, I more feel like I built the combo up to get the most points than I built an engine to to score points. Because you don't know what they're going to want, right? Like you don't know what the magnates are going to want, which wines are going to be worth the most that last round. Right. So the, you're, you're missing definitely. you're missing some of that future information. Yeah. That would make it a more efficient engine. So you do um, get, definitely get the progression of you yeah. make better wine as you there, go on. There, 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 there are off. again there are engine building aspects. Yeah. But like we mentioned, you without that information it's hard to build the best right. system at the beginning to get the engine efficient and if i remember in viticulture this is how long it's been you can also you draft people right you have your summer help and your winter help and i think there's some permanence there with building up what what help you have right. and someone mentioned the rhine valley expansion for viticulture really ramping up the engine building uh, I don't have that though. So uh, D is asking about Caverna. Yeah, Caverna is definitely an engine. All, all every Uve Rosenberg. I, <laughs> I think every well, no, Bonanza is not. But all of his big farming games that I know of, uh, Caverna and, and Agricola definitely. Um, one of the best examples of that is that you are um, you get more workers, right? So that's another aspect is you add more people to your family to let you get more actions. And with more actions, you get to get more stuff done. And it's all about building the resources to do it. But again, it's a big focus on card combos, right? It's a uh, putting the right, uh, what are they called? This shows how long, no, Caverna doesn't have card combos. Caverna is building the buildings, building the right buildings that go along with whatever engine you're doing. So if you're trying to collect animals and that's another way to, if you can, here's, here's another way you can tell if a game's an engine builder is if you can talk about the engine, right? So if you can talk about how, oh, I went with a farm strategy or I went with a animal strategy, you're probably talking about an engine builder because there's, you built the thing that keeps letting you get more farms and the farms produce more goods that you can sell to get more money. Or I kept mining it out, leveling up my dwarves so I could get deeper into the mines. Those are two different engines that you could go for in Caverna or combine. So I think that's another way you could see it. Space Base, uh, I haven't played. It's I own a copy. Space Base, from what I understand, is very similar to um, Kingdoms, uh, the Valeria game that we like. Valeria Card Kingdoms. And I would definitely say that's an engine build. Again, very random base, but you definitely get the because I got this, I then get to convert this. And because I converted that, I get more of this. And then I'm going to use that to go kill the bigger, badder, bad guy. That's going to give me more of a thing to let me kill the bigger, badder, bad guy. Or collect kingdoms, because kingdoms are also worth points. And I, assuming space based, from what I understand, is similar to that, then yes. Uh, Puerto Rico would be a classic engine builder. Right. Where you're you're gonna try to build a combo with the buildings you have to produce the 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 goods and sell them and get the money to ship the people. Mm. All right, I think that's the main ones we got. So so Deanna's list was uh, Race for the Galaxy, Viticulture, Caverna, Puerto Rico, Terraforming and Mars. Terraforming Mars. Yep. I think that's a pretty good list. I don't know if that was five. 
Uh, Rogers mentioned Steam Park. Steam Park, I have not tried. That one looks really cool. That's a, It goes very well with a game we're going to review when we get back from the coffee break. That's all about building a theme park for robots. And that's all I know about is I love the theme of that game. Is Not that you're just building a theme park, but you're building a theme park for robots to enjoy. Right. So that one looked cool. Um, one of the games he bought off me, Steam O Time, which yes, I know it's not called that, but that shouldn't put the gear right between the two <laughs> words. Steam O Time is definitely has some engine building aspects. Again, I it's more of a worker placement game. I did see it on other people's best engine builders. What does the chat think? Is is it a mechanic or is it a result of mechanics? That's that's <laughs> there. That's the final. We should, I, oh, I can't remember how to do polls. I would totally run a poll in in the chat right now if I could remember how to do polls on on uh oh I can't remember is it poll? Here, start a prediction. Why prediction? I have no idea. Okay, that said, start a poll. There we go. I got it. All right, there we go. Channel points now available in polls. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's an experience. Today we're going to take a look at Funfair, a standalone game based on the theme park building game Unfair. Thank you, Good Games Publishing, for sending us a review copy of both games. Funfair was designed by Joel Finch, who was also the designer of Unfair. Features artwork by Lena Cassette Dave Forrest. Funfair just hit the market this year in early 2021 and should just be showing up on store shelves about now. Funfair is meant to be a lighter and much less cutthroat version of the board game Unfair from the same designer and publisher. This makes it both more family friendly as well as a good entry point to the Unfair series of games. Now Funfair plays two to four players and is all about building a theme park from the ground up starting with just one gate. This game is lightning quick with games taking under an hour with players who know the game. First game might take a little longer. Our first game with only two players did take about an hour max. Well, to get a look at what you get in a copy of Funfair from Good Games Publishing, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, there are a few things I want to highlight here as well on the show today. Um, for one, this is a card-driven game. So the majority of the box is cards, uh, 150 cards. Uh, these are of great playing card quality and feature excellent thematic deep park artwork, and even better iconography that is great and easy to read from across the table. There is a two-sided board included in this game, mainly to just hold the various cards in place while you're playing. And I gotta say it's unique, and I think it's worth calling out because it's designed so that one side of the board, all the cards face one way. The other side of the board has half the cards facing one way and the other half the cards facing the other. And which side you use is meant to be determined based on where you place the board. So if you're placing the board in front of everyone, you would face them all one way. Because if you're putting it between the players, you would put it as facing both ways. Personally, both Deanna and I found we liked all the cards one way. It didn't matter how we were seated, whether it was on the same side or opposite. But I liked seeing that option. Yeah, it's nice to have that option, depending on how you want to sit with your, your partner or opponent or whatever you prefer to call them uh, in a given game. <laughs> now, the next thing of note is the currency in the game. Uh, these are poker chip-like coins in $1, $5, and $25 denominations. These are thick cardboard tokens, really thick cardboard that came pre-punched. Now, not only is each of these clearly denoted by color, so they're easy to tell apart, they're also told apart by size and shape. The $1 is the smallest and round, the $5 is larger and hexagonal, and the 25 is even bigger and rectangular. This is some of the most accessible money I've seen in a board game. Great for people with color blindness or other color, or sorry, other vision issues. Now, what I wasn't impressed at all by was the box insert, especially when comparing Funfair to Unfair, which has a nice molded insert specifically designed to hold sleeved or unsleeved cards into separate decks. Here, you just get a cardboard trough divided into four parts, none of which are actually good at holding cards. I can only assume this was done to keep the cost on Funfair down to make this version of the game more accessible, so I guess that makes sense, but it was a little disappointing. Yeah, unfortunately, economy drives choices, and it is a tough one, especially when you're seeing both of them. Although, yeah. I think because it is intended as a the, the starting point, it would actually kind of be nice 
when you moved from Funfair to Unfair to see that upgrade with the product. So yep. now what is it we do with all these cards? All right. So each player starts a game of fun fair with a random showcase card. This is your, your big expensive themed thrill ride. There are four different ones, each with the four different themes in the game. Have a gate card that represents the front gate to your park that generates you one coin every turn. You get 30 coins and five random park cards. Now the majority of the cards in the game are these park cards. They're a mix of attractions Upgrades for those attractions and part staff. Now, attractions, there are various types. They include thrill rides, leisure rides, sideshows, theaters, and food outlets. Now, upgrades, these are played on top of attractions, include features, uh, things like the loop-to-loop -loop for a thrill ride or comfortable seating, which can be added to any type of attraction. Guest services, which include things like lockers and coat checks or an express queue. Qualities. Uh, there are two different qualities included this game. One's, uh, I forget, Deluxe, and then there's another uh, slightly higher superior or something are the two qualities. And then there are themes. In this particular set, there are four themes included, fairy tale, pirate, jungle, and robot themes. The other type of cards are your staff cards. These give you a mix of in-game and end-game bonuses while playing. At the start of the game, you're going to draw one random award card. This is placed faced up on the board. This is going to give one player 15 points at the end of the game for fulfilling its requirement. These are always based on like a most or least of something. So they include having like having the most themes used in your park or having the most quality upgrades in your park, etc. Each round of the game actually starts with players drawing the top city event card. There are one of these for each round of the game. These are all good things which is a big change from unfair from what I understand. These are all things that help the players. They're going to be cards like surprise gift that gives players a free card from the deck that they can either keep or swap for one in the market or a change of plans, which lets you discard part cards from your hand and draw new ones. After resolving the city step, you then move into the park step. And this is the meat of the game. Here, players take turns taking one action at a time. In general, players are going to start with three of these actions, though building that showcase ride I mentioned earlier does unlock a fourth action each round. Now, the actions include build. You pay the cost of one of the cards in your hand or one of the cards in the central market and put it into play and do what it says on the card. Now, there are spot in your park for five different attractions, and each attraction can have any number of upgrades added to it, but never two of the same upgrade with the same name. Parks can also contain any number of staff cards. Now, while all upgrades include, increase the point value of your attraction at the end of the game, most of them also include some other special rules on them, like letting you draw more cards, get money back from the bank, pass cards to other players, and so on. Your next action is take. This is how you get cards. You either take a card from the central market and put it in your hand to save for later, or discard a park card from your hand to draw five random cards from the deck and keep one. The other thing, blueprint card, you're going to take two of these and keep zero or one of them. Now, blue cards are endgame scoring cards, and these are going to be similar to anyone who knows Ticket to Ride, which I assume most people know Ticket to Ride at this point. They're going to have a requirement listed on them and a bonus. The requirement includes things like have a thrill ride with at least two feature upgrades, or have a theater that includes a theme, a guest service, and a feature, and so on. If by the end of the game, you fulfilled all of the requirements on a blueprint card, you score the points listed. But if you don't fulfill them, you lose 10 points. Now, if you have fulfilled all the requirements, each blueprint card also has a bonus section that you can only get if you fulfill it. So for example, the blueprint that requires you to have a thrill ride and two features gives you a bonus if you also have a food outlet in play. So you get the, the basic points if you have the main thing and you can possibly earn bonus points. Now, each of these cards are ranked easy, medium, or hard and have point values associated with them based on how difficult they are to fulfill. Now, the blueprint action, it's worth noting, does become unavailable the last two turns of the game. This is well done in the game design-wise because there's a blueprint closing car soon card that you put in the city deck. And whenever that comes up, it warns everyone, hey, you got one more turn to buy blueprints. And then when you actually get to the round where they're closed, you actually flip the card over and says blueprints closed and you put it on the deck. So that was some, a nice piece of design that does a good job of indicating to players when and you can and can't buy blueprints. Uh, the next action is called loose change. Uh, this represents thematically scrounging around your attractions, looking for change that fell out of people's pockets. Uh, you get a buck for every attraction you have in your park up to five. 
One final action exists, which is demolish. This lets you remove a card from your park. Uh, there are a few reasons you might want to do this. For one, you can only have five rides, so you might want to, or sorry, I shouldn't say rides, attractions, because they're not all rides. You might have five attractions, and you might find something you want more, but more likely, you're probably going to do it to fulfill one of those blueprint cards, which will say something like, you need six of this, or you need four of this, or you need rides ranking one, two, three, four, five. And well, you, if you have a six, you might want to demolish a card. Well, that makes sense. So there's quite a bit of... Um... You know, it's it's not quite theme park builder like the the old role playing game, the old uh, the old uh, video game PC game uh, yeah. the old PC game, but uh, it's it's feeling a lot like that, and giving you that experience, but in a in a less involved uh, you know detail oriented aspect, right. more, more generalized card. Yeah, I can see that. I totally agree with that. So once everyone's completed their three or four actions, you go to the guest step. Here's where players make money. You get an income based on the star value of their attractions, which is just a number list in the top right corner of their cards in a star. Again, the iconography here is top notch. You're also going to get bonus income from stuff, some app members, the ticket holders they're called. For example, the cotton candy vendor will give you two extra coins for every leisure ride in your park. And there's a bunch of these for all the different types of rides. The other thing that happens in the guest is that outside investors you five coins towards the completion of your showcase ride. Now, these showcase rides, I mentioned this at the start of the review here, are big rides, right? They cost 20 bucks, which is a ton of money. They provide three income a turn, so they have a three-star rating, and they give you a fourth action every round. And a big part of the game is deciding when to build these because every round at the end of the round, you get $5 for free, right? $5 that goes towards building this. Do you want to wait until they're paid off or almost paid off? Or do you want to spend the money yourself early on to get that extra action and start generating that three income? That's a big decision in the game. No, absolutely. It's uh, th there's some, some fun things in there. And I like the fact that it's that sort of, you, you, you jump to, you don't have to worry about your, uh, uh, worry about the people during the building because that's one of the the biggest problems mm -hmm. I think is with a lot of people with the theme park uh, video game is you know you have to open it up and get people in there right away but you're still trying to deal with the park itself and it over complete complicates things and they've taken that away by separating it here yeah and they totally abstracted it right like you just get a bunch of money this isn't like um dinosaur island is that the, yeah dinosaur yeah. island where you're drawing hooligans there's none of that there's no hooligans and good people and right. star guests it's just an abstract you add up your star rating get that much money uh finally there's a cleanup phase as you expect in many of these type of games the market's wiped it's important to know it's wiped every round so if you don't if you see something up there and you don't buy it it's gonna be gone uh players then do have to discard down to five part cards if they have more than that and the first player marker just moves to the left now this is going to continue for six rounds at the end of which you move to final scoring you get points for a bunch of different things here. I don't know if I quite call it a point salad, but there are quite a few different ways to get points. So the first and foremost way to get points is your attraction size. So each of your attractions, you're going to add up the icons on them for the attraction itself and for every upgrade. Now you're going to get points based on the total number. So these ramp up, right? So one with only three icons were 12 points one with fours were 16 right so you're only going up by four but as you get up to six it starts going up by five then it starts going up by six for example eight is worth 38 points now this track goes to 17 which i i don't know i don't i, I don't even i'd have to count the cards to see if there are 17 different upgrades you can put on one ride we've never seen it get that high we tend to like max out at six seven maybe eight you're then going to get points for blueprints. I mentioned these earlier, right? You're going to get points for having it completed. You might earn some bonus points. You're going to lose points if you didn't complete them. Every coin you have is worth, um, sorry, every two coins is worth one point at the end of the game. So your income from visitors is big at the end. All of the staff member cards are going to be worth points. Some are just worth a static point, three points or two points. But then there's going to be others that give points based on other stuff you have in your park. A big one of these are the performer cards. And there's one of these for each of the themes. So the robot performer, for example, gives you three points for every robot themed attraction in your park. Then there's the awards, which I mentioned earlier. It's randomized at the start of the game. It's going to give someone 15 points. Add all this up, player with the most points wins. Straightforward enough. So one thing I do want to call out here is an excellent fun for scorekeeping piece of software. Uh, this is something Good Games Publishing has posted online. Now, I wanted to call it an app, but it's not an app because there's nothing to download. Rather, it's just a web-based, you just go to a certain website, there's a QR code in the instruction book to get you there. And 
a uh, what I did is I just you can shortcut any web page. So I put a shortcut on my phone and I just tap it, and it walks you through the scoring process and does all the math for you. You just enter the numbers. So it starts off goes like ride one, how many icons did you have? Ride two, how many icons? Ride three, and so on. Blueprints one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And your bonus is earned, and like like it does all the math in the background, which I thought was excellent, and it does a good job of it. Like it works really well. What I also thought was really cool is they they clearly explain this is that they are using this app to do research on the game to see what people's scores are like to watch for any trends anything they can use to improve the game in the future and i thought this was really cool to see yeah so i mean i know in uh unfair they have put out uh, additional themes and uh you know uh, not dlc but uh, you know expansions to the parks Uh, And it sounds like what they'll probably end up doing or what they're able to do here is if they put out expansions, they can balance that or rebalance Mm -hmm. if necessary based on how people have been scoring. Yeah. And the other thing I noticed with unfair with the expansion, they actually put out some errata cards that included right with the expansion to replace some overpowered cards. Now, as for my thoughts on this game, I'm going to say it. I don't say this straight off the bat very often but i was extremely impressed by this like like every aspect of it this is just like it's a good game like it's just there's just something about this game that feels very well done and it feels polished like it just feels like a lot of work went into this that it's been tweaked and play tested and tried and tested and designed for maximum fun and playability it's just a very finished feel to this game and i think uh, realistically i think we know why that's happening <laughs> well yeah that, like a lot of this has to do with the fact that this is a follow-up and standalone version of unfair right this is a game on its own unfair is very well regarded by a number of people uh now i admit i've not played unfair i haven't tried this myself but i will say that you know they took what worked from unfair and used it to build fun fair Now, I've also heard, and I don't know if this is true, but this game was made as a direct result of people complaining about the unfairness of unfair, which is supposed to be part of the game. It's called unfair for a reason. Now, this includes the cutthroat player versus player nature of the game, but there's also more to it, which um, I saw a few people discussing on Twitter, is that unfair is just mean. Like, there are event cards that come up that affect all the players that just ruin your plans and ruin what's happening. All of that nastiness has been removed from unfair and put into funfair, removed from funfair to make it more fun. Right. Like really the only way to do anything to another player is to perhaps hate draft a card, you know, they want, but even that though, I don't think it's a real valid thing to do because for one, there's multiple copies of most of the cards. So if they don't get it now, they'll probably be able to get it later. And pretty much anytime I played, it just seems way more valuable to take something that helps you than take something you don't want just to hurt someone else. It just doesn't seem like a valid option. You don't get a lot of actions in this turn and having to use your action to hate draft just seems like a waste of an action in this game. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I think I, I have to say, I am probably going to prefer Funfair. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not a take that player. I, I don't really yeah. enjoy those games uh, for various reasons. Um, you know, if I'm playing games with my friends, they're my friends. I don't want to be <laughs> attacking it and, and bashing them up that much. I mean, it's, it's, it, there, there's a difference between, you know, playing something like a Fortnite where yes. you're out there to kill, kill people. But even that I'm usually on a team with my friends and I don't know the other people in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I realistically Funfair is probably going to be the game of this set that I'm going to choose as well. Yeah, and I definitely know people that be on the same side with you. Like, um, I remember sitting and playing Horizons with Ian at the local game store and throwing in the Extermination expansion and yep. hating it. Yep. Meanwhile, I preferred it with Extermination. So yep. this is definitely going to, to appeal to a different audience or perhaps the same audience. Mm-hmm. So getting back to positives here, um, design of the cards is top notch. Like there's just, I don't know what research went into it, how many different trials they did, but it just works. Like the iconography is really easy to read across the table, which mainly becomes important with those, um, awards who's winning the awards. So who has the most of something? Um, but it also is really great for just looking quickly down at your own cards to figure out if you qualify for a blueprint, like they able to look to see, does my ride have three features as a matter of the other three, uh, flag symbols in my row of cards. So it's really simple. Um, I also like the two-sided board. Like that's just a nice touch. Um, 
and well, I already told you the, the money's fantastic. Like I, this is top notch. Like I get it, it could be plastic. It could be non cardboard that would improve it. But the design of that money is some of the best I've ever seen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think um, because we are starting with the end, um, even though this is the gateway game, it has benefited from mm -hmm. the experience of the, the unfair uh, market research and, yeah. and time and they clearly want to step, put their best foot forward. So yep. they are, while they may have done things like the box insert is less than ideal. Yeah. The quality of the actual playing pieces, not the, not the box that you put it, put yes. it away in yeah, the stuff yes. that you're using out there on the table is right up there with something mm -hmm. that you want more of. And so hopefully we'll find out that that all continues when we jump into un unfair at a later date. Yeah, true enough. Yeah, so like the, any complaints about the game, I only have really two. Uh, the first is that box insert. Uh, talked about it above. It just, it, it just even if you're going to make a trough, make it the right size for holding cards. Like it just, this is a card game with 150 cards. And it's, why not design a box for holding 150 cards? It, it's, a, it's an odd choice. Um, there are going to be people out there complaining of wasted space in this box. Um, it's not as a splendor level of wasted space, but there isn't a lot of air in this box. Um, and again, comparing this to unfair, which again, this game came out after, even though this is supposed to be the intro, this game did come out after seeing that to this, but I get it right. Like the point was, I'm sure the point was to keep the cost down. Like we were talking earlier about feedback on some of our Robotech reviews that, um, the company solar flare games specifically designed force of arms to be under 20 bucks, to be an easy entry point. I'm sure a similar decision went into making this game that they wanted it to be at a certain price point. Now, my other complaint with this game deals with one card and a string of bad luck. I don't know. Uh, the card is the part. So this staff member gives players two points for every blueprint they've collected during the game, as well as it makes it so you can't lose points for having incomplete blueprints. And we have found that if a player gets this early in the game, especially in their starting hand, they are almost guaranteed to win because all they have to do is collect blueprints, not have to worry about fulfilling them or not, because there were two points no matter what, and then still be able to fulfill two, three, four, or as many as you can. The, there was one game where Deanna scored 95 or 150 points, like two-thirds of her points just due to blueprints in that card. Now, there's only one copy in a deck of, well, it's not a deck of 150 park cards, but it's maybe 100 cards of the park cards. Like, so you got like a one, one in a hundred chance of drawing that card in your starting hand. But if that does happen, it just seems a little overpowered. So I, I we've actually seen that happen twice now. So I don't know, as, as a host rule, I actually recommend just either pull that card out when you're handing out your initial cards, or if you happen to draw that one, just shuffle it back into the deck just for that first round. If it comes up the first round, throw it back in because later in the game, you're not going to hoard the cards right from the start. That just one card. That's one where I wish I could put in that scoring app where they're collecting all the data somehow put what cards we drafted. Cause I, I wonder if anyone else has seen this now, this game's so new. I couldn't find anything on board game geek. No one else complaining about this. There are some reviews out there. I didn't see anyone else calling this out. So maybe it's just like Deanna has ridiculous luck because this happened to her twice. I don't know what it is. I wonder if um, if you shouldn't just um, uh, seed the deck. So you know, do the shuffle, do a do a cut, throw him in there, and then uh, and yeah, then it's, it, I don't know. I don't know if I'd, it'd be it'd be too punishing to put him in the second half, so he wouldn't be worth it at all buying because it's mm. not a cheap card. But just you just hoard all the blueprints. Right. Like it, it's it's at the point where like. The, the scoring app only allows you to put six in. You could collect, excuse me. The scoring app only allows you to put six blueprint cards into your, into the scoring app. But what if you have seven or eight? Cause you could do that with this card. Is there, a, I don't know. Well, if, if the game, if the app only allows you to do so many, is there something extreme that you, uh, we did miss? <laughs> see anything? I, I will admit our first play, we did miss the fact that it's um, when you draw two blueprints, you can only keep one. We thought it was, you could keep one or two, right. but that, we fixed that right? right and then it happened again we're like i don't know it's just that one card I, and it didn't make me feel like the rest of the cards might be suspect or anything like that it's just that one particular card i don't know the cost again i think it's just luck it's it's the luck of getting that at the beginning of the game which lets you gear your entire strategy towards that one card 
Because it's another one of those where you don't even have to put the card in play until the very end of the game. So you can just hold on to that till the last round and decide if you want to play it or not. I just found it, like Deanna said, it's a string of good luck instead of bad luck. Well, bad luck for your opponents. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, other than those two minor complaints, I love everything about this game. Like, I, I am... I kind of blown away. Like I, it's not often you sit down to a good game and you're just like, Oh, that was a good game. Like it just had that feeling. I think what I like the most though, is to do this very fulfilling engine building experiences. I built something. I did something. I've created something in about it very common in most engine building games, especially uh, bigger engine building games that when you get to the end of the game, all you want is one more turn. Like, like to me, that's a common aspect of engine building games is the, oh, I just, if I had one more turn, I could have done so much of this. I could have, if I could have just ran it one more time and I always want that one more turn. And I didn't get that at all in fun fair. Actually, I get the exact opposite. It just feels like it was exactly the right length. I had just enough time to get the things in place I wanted to have in place. Like, no, not do everything I wanted to do because then the game would be easy. Like just enough to fulfill a couple of or maybe get both of the bonuses for those blueprints. Or like, I know I pushed my luck and took three blueprints and I'm taking a risk and it feels like, oh, I might be able to do it, but I didn't, but I don't feel bad about it. Like it just, it feels like, like, like of all the games we played, sure, we could play one more turn. But at that point, it would just feel like everyone gets more points. Like, I don't right. think we would have made a significant change to our park. We right. just would have upgraded a few more things, gotten a few more points. Like, we had gotten to the end of that progression. Like, the timing is just perfect. And that's that's an important thing that doesn't happen all that often when it comes to games. So to, to find out that they have managed to balance it so nicely is a really, uh, really speaks well to the design of this game, whether it's based off of something else or not. Yeah. Um, they've done a good job. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's that that satiating feeling. Like it just you feel like you've done it. It, it feels like a bigger game. Like overall, I, this is a, a great theme park building game. I, I will honestly say the best theme park building game I've ever played. Not that I played a lot of them. There are a <laughs> few out there I've tried. Like this is it, it's filler level, right? It's it's less than an hour. You'd call it a filler, but it just it doesn't feel like a filler. Like right. it it feels very rewarding. Like I get the 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 experience of a big heavy game in a surprisingly short time period. And I find that like shocking, impressive. It's expertly designed, feels very polished. Now I'll admit, I I haven't tried Unfair, but I don't think it matters. Even if you played Unfair or not, I think this is a fantastic standalone game. This is a great weight game. It's a perfect gateway to hobby board games, I think, and engine building. Like in general, like this is going to be up there for me with um, games like Imhotep for a very st- different style of game, but like a, hey, here's what hobby games can do. Check this out. You're going to feel like you built a theme park in less than an hour. I think that there is also enough here that experienced gamers are going to enjoy it. Like as a fan of heavy games, we were t- earlier talking in this same podcast about Arkwright and how much I enjoy it. I found this to just be fulfilling. Like it, it didn't feel like a light filler, lightweight. Yeah, it's a gateway game. It was enjoyable. I, I, I honestly can't help but recommend this one. Like of gamers of all experience level. I can't think of a group of gamers who are going to hate this. Right. Unless you just don't like hobby games. Like it's just one of those games that seems to, like it's up there with the Azuls and the, and, and the Emoteps, the, the games that I think are going to appeal to a very broad range of people. Amazing. Well, also be sure to check out our written review of Funfair by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews. And now, on to the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right, despite no recordings for a few weeks, I haven't, like, sat down and played a ton of gaming, at least not tabletop gaming. So I have been dealing with an illness that was, is, we're not possibly sure, possibly COVID-19. Despite a negative test result, I had to quarantine in my basement for 14 days. So this meant lots of sleeping, watching Netflix, and playing Nintendo Switch. Um, now I know there are a ton of board games on the switch. Everyone keeps telling me it's like the best system to get for board gaming. I want to hear from people what are worth picking up, which switch games are good. Cause at this point I don't own any of them. I wasn't gonna, I, yes, I wanted to go onto the Nintendo eShop and buy 40 games, <laughs> but, uh, I don't have the budget for that. I got to be a little more exclusive. 
Um, so I would love to hear recommendations from our fans because you folk know what we like, what kind of games we like, what are worth picking up. Um, and then maybe I can look into those. Maybe we'll start reviewing some switchboard games on the show. Now, personally, what I have been playing is Animal Crossing because it's Animal Crossing. I love Animal Crossing. And uh, the other one is I picked up the new version of Katamari Damashi, which I, I don't know what is with that messed up Japanese <laughs> game, but I have loved that since the original version on the PlayStation. I just love hearing the music. I love that game. So I've been playing that a lot. Um, the other thing, too, with the Switch, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the system. It's got some idiosyncrasies. I know there's a way to add friends or put in friend codes or something. Cause when I go to play animal crossing, it's like, here, check your friend list. And I don't have one. So if you have a switch and you want to interact online or you want to share friend codes, feel free, hit me up, uh, send me your code or whatever. And I'll figure out how to put that in the system. And maybe we can game together. or something. Now when feeling better, um, the other thing I played a lot of is Spider-Man on the PlayStation four, uh, finished the main plot and part of the black cat DLC, but I don't know enough about, we're not a video game show. So we'll move to the tabletop gaming. So as far as tabletop gaming, um, we've been playing fun fair a lot, which as you could tell, we've been enjoying too, uh, you. but it wasn't until our last couple of plays that I noticed how quick it was. Like it's one of those, as I mentioned in the review, it just doesn't feel like a filler game. Like it feels surprisingly fulfilling, lasting exactly as long as it should. It does, it feels like you've played a bigger game. So it's like one of those, I'm like, oh, seriously? Like, like I happened to look at my watch and I'm like, wait, did we finish that in under an hour? Like what time did we start playing? Yeah. And wow, it only took 40 minutes. Kind of blew me away that way. Yeah, no, I'd, it, it just sounds like a great game and I can't wait for this all to be over because this is one that I'm, I'm really eager to to get down there and try um I, is that available online anywhere I uh if it's on tabletopia or anything well to be honest i mean i have to say you know there are enough theme park builders out there on you know, online that it would be interesting to know why i would play a tabletop version of it online rather than just go to a theme park uh well, experience i suppose but uh, i'm just saying if you want it you and i want yeah, to yeah, play no. the game together to show absolutely. you the game yeah, yeah no absolutely uh, as for Switch, um, as a deck building connoisseur, I would go with uh, Slay the Spire. Um, oh, is that on Switch? As far as I know, really I, as far as I know, it is. Um, Slay the Spire is is obviously fantastic. Um, so you know, if you're looking for a, a deck builder, there you go. Oh, I, yeah, I've heard really good. I know you ended up hooked on it after we talked about it last time. Yeah, yeah, that is one I want to try. Uh, so the other tabletop game I got to the table this last week was uh, Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons, uh, kindly sent to us to check out from Ravensburger. Uh, this is a cooperative Wonder Woman themed game from Prospero Hall. Uh, just by mentioning that name, everyone should already have some ideas in your head. We've talked about them many times, uh, now owned by Funko themselves. Uh, they've... We've mentioned them pretty much since we discovered Minecraft builders and biomes. And then it was horrified. And they're like, oh, Jaws is from them. And oh, of course, they did the Funko verse game. Like, I, uh, Prospero Hall now, like, if seeing that name in a box is almost a buy it before you try it, in my opinion, at this point. And Wonder Woman is no exception. Excellent. Now, we've only played this once. Now, the main vibe I keep getting from this game is why is no one talking about this game? Like, I, there's no buzz about this at all um doing the whole tabletop deals thing it's been dirt cheap on amazon forever like it seems like no one cares about this game or it's been completely missed over and it's really solid and rather unique well there was you know what i remember when this game came out uh and i remember being uh disappointed that you hadn't gotten a copy of it at the at the initial release because yeah. right at that you know at the time of release they did a media blitz um there was a lot of twitter buzz but it dropped off like a cliff. Yeah, it stopped. Like there no was one. there was the push. Hey, look, all our favorite reviewers have got this game, and they're going to put out reviews on the on the you know in the right time frame, and then no one is ever going to talk about it again. Yeah, it seems like that. Like I don't know, I don't know what it is. So I do plan on doing a, an in depth review of this one in the future. But I, what I want to highlight is a couple things here and now that I thought stood out about this game. So. First of all, I like program movement games. I have ever since Robo Rally, um, 
you'd have to be a pretty long-term fan of the show to hear me rave about program movement games because it's been a while since a new one's come out. And this is a program movement game that does something new and unique with it. So you use cards to program your turn, but the way it starts is at the start of every round, everyone gets a hand of two cards. And then as a team, you discuss what you're going to do. What are you gonna, Are you going to go over here? I'm going to go fight Ares. I'm going to go recruit those Amazons. I'm going to go over here and get some warriors and so on, right? You talk about all that. And you're like, all right, go. Now everyone gets three more cards. So they have five cards total. They're going to pick three of those cards to program their moves in. So you get three moves, one, two, three. During this programming phase, you can't talk anymore. So what's interesting is you're planning your turn with imperfect information. You only know two of your potential three cards, and you may not eat those two. And once it ends up sitting down to actually program, you might go along with the plan just with everyone, but you might find something even better to do, which really, I don't know, it's really neat. It's, it's, it's a unique dynamic. And now we've only played once, and it seemed really cool. And I'm, I'm a little worried, that especially with a bigger group, you might end up with some hard feelings. Well, I thought you were going to go over there and do Well, I didn't get the cards to do it. Or I thought this would be cool. Now the whole book words is maybe go off and do something even more heroic. So they try to play it up as a, you'll do something better than your plan. Though I do worry with the wrong group that people may get hurt feelings over not following the plan, but I've never seen this like weird mix of hidden information with programming. I thought it was really neat. Interesting. The other aspect of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons that impressed me is the way they use the same components for different things in the same board game. Like we often see the same types of components used in different games, but this is all the same game. So the game contains three different villains you can face off against with some different rules for each one. Now the default gameplay is to face off against Ares, but there's also rules to face off against Circe and the Cheetah. Now the game comes with four different colors of clear cubes. And these represent different things depending on what scenario you're playing. So when you're playing Ares, the default game, the white cubes are Amazon warriors. And actually the white cubes are the same over all three. They're the one that doesn't change. But then you have other stuff. The white cubes can be spent to improve your actions. Purple cubes when fighting Ares represent corrupted Amazons. So if Ares moves into a spot where there's white cubes, it turns them into purple. Orange cube represent Ares' warriors. They're servants of war. And they start trying to take over the Amazon island of Thermoscara. Green cubes are barricades. You place those on roads between locations. You can't pass between them without spending enough um, agility actions to be able to get through them. So there's your cubes in that game. But then if you swap it up and you're like, nah, this time we're going to play against Cheetah. Well, with Cheetah, your white cubes, again, are still your Amazon warriors. But now the purple cubes are wounded Amazons that you try to move on the map to bring them to places to get healed. The yellows are lycanthropes that can attack and wound your Amazons. And the green cubes are hunting parties moving around the map trying to kill you. And I thought that was really cool. And then when you play these, they, of course, represent different things. Like Amazons getting turned into pigs or wolves. I thought that was a really excellent design. Like, it was a really good way... Like, I, like everyone hates generic resource cubes. Here's one where you couldn't replace them with miniatures because in every scenario, the cube means something different. But I thought it was brilliant to see that in one game. Overall, I, Wonder Woman seems good. I, like, I, I wouldn't call it simple, but I think it's at that complexity level. My kids will enjoy it. Like I, the last co-op game we played with them was the, the Back to the Future Dice Through Time. And I, they, they found that simple. Like they found it easy. Like I could have played that with younger kids. Whereas this one I think is at the right level, especially for my oldest to enjoy. Now what I'm worried about going back to Back to the Future is little G didn't like the, the planning part. She didn't like all the talking before we did things. Well, that happened in that game. That wasn't a, a phase of the game. Whereas that's literally phase one is look at your cards and talk. So I don't know how well that'll go over with her, but I am looking forward to checking out uh, more am more Wonder Woman with other ones. And we did win on our first play, which in a way is a bad sign for a co-op game, <laughs> but it felt tight. Like it felt close enough that I could right. see how you could fail. An element of risk is always nice to go with. Um, as for me, I've uh, gotten clanked at the table again. Uh, my daughter is apparently a, uh, <laughs> a, a wonder kind of uh, clank playing. She trounced us uh, yet again. Uh, mm -hmm. For some reason, she's got, you know, a combination of luck and and skill because i mean you know you you know where you're uh you know she, she's going right for those uh the high level artifacts um regardless of the thought and she's she's planned out you know i'm gonna go to the high artifacts and then i'm gonna jump over 
to grab a backpack so that I can get one more before I get yeah, out. And that's what I was going to ask him. Like, are the, is, yeah. she, is she getting two artifacts? Yeah, she's, she's getting the two artifacts and, and really, uh, you know, coming up, uh, coming up, uh, with a huge success. Um, I, I would, of the strategy I would try to do is the, is the dash and grab. Right. The, the super quick, the, grab something and get, like grab just one artifact and get out as quick as possible. Well, and that's what I did the, in my works. first game. In my first game, I got like 107 points. Uh, and yet she still managed to get 120 points by, 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 you know, by grabbing, enough grabbing, stuff, yeah. grabbing enough stuff. Um, so it was, it's been interesting. Uh, and then, uh, the other thing that I've got going on is my discord based game of masks has finally started up. Um, and we've had some, it, we, we had, we, it was a rough start. Uh, <laughs> we, we've been, we, we struggled to get the right player count and the right player pound who could actually all be online mm -hmm. and play a four hour session, you know, at least once a week or so. Oh, so it's, it's not like a play by forum. It's a, no, no, we've actually got a, a discord server dedicated to the group, uh, multiple channels. We've got in character channels, out of character channels, uh, dice rolling, separate dice rolling channels. Um, uh, and what we've got, so we've got a core group of three players, uh, plus myself. And then we've actually got one other player who, uh, wasn't able to join us as often as they thought they were able to, mm. but, uh, may actually, uh, jump in once in a while because they are, they are a separate character class that works thematically if we can, if we can pull them in right. once in a while. Um, uh, we've had some, it, and what I'm really happy with is the, uh, the buy-in from the players has been fantastic. Um, one of the players is actually far, far more experienced with PBTA <laughs> and masks in particular than I am. Um, and they've been keeping me really honest. Uh, you know, they're, they're willing to push back and question me on my, on my, you know, rulings for, for roles and things. And it's been helping me get more comfortable <laughs> with my own choices in the game. And that's been fantastic. They've actually been playing it since before it was released. They were, they were, nice. they, they've play tested it. Um, yeah, it's a the rule lawyer. Yeah, it's 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 not. They're they're definitely not rule lawyers. They're just asking me why I've done things, you know, and why mm -hmm. what makes that decision, or what if, have you thought about this? And and sometimes I'm like, no, no, I'm I'm really happy with what I did. And other times I'm like, oh, you know what? In the in the in the future, I'm gonna think one of the big problems in masks, and it's not necessarily a problem, but because powers don't really uh, mechanically make a difference, mm -hmm. it's all it's all narrative. Uh, one of the the questions that comes up in a lot of things, and it's discussed endlessly on forums is action at a distance. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the, the two main powers, uh, moves you get that are, you know, combat based for, uh, are unleash the power and mm -hmm. directly engage a threat. Now, unleash the power is reserved for when you're doing something new or, or something massive. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, with your power, you know, something, not just, you know, shooting, shooting bolts out of your hands at somebody. Um, mm. But directly engaging a threat involves results, which some people can initiate, can think of as very melee oriented. Mm. So when you, you really need to take, uh, take a step back and think about how you can describe and how you can narratively engage if you're directly engaging a threat at a distance. vast distance. Okay. Um, and so that yeah, sounds like something that needs to be fixed in a second edition or something. Well, like it's it, not necessarily fixed as it just sort of needs to be, be clarified. clarified. Yeah. It, it, it's really kind of the one big thing. And it really does seem to come up a lot through masks is, is action at a distance uh, powers or even, you know, arrow is an, is another example. Yeah. That's what you I was know, just bone, thinking. Bone arrow, I'm like, I'm like I wonder bolts. if the designers for some reason just had certain type of superheroes stuck in their head and hadn't thought of raised yeah, blasters. Now, there, there may even be another class. I'm, we're only using the base classes. We haven't used any of the expansion classes. There may be another class in one of the other books, uh, that, that handles that specifically, but not, not really. And again, it, it can work like, out. I, I almost wonder if it. it needs a custom move for indirectly. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> to me, foe. to me, I, I, you know, we had an interesting, uh, uh, occurrence. Uh, someone actually came at the bad guy, um, adjacently deliberately avoiding a direct conflict with him. Mm -hmm. Um, but we wanted a, I wanted a chance of results. So I, 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 
engaged a role. Um, and after discussion at the end of the session, uh, it turns out in hindsight, I probably wouldn't ask for that to roll again based on the narrative mm -hmm. situation we were in. Um, but it's, it's been interesting. And one of the things I'm, uh, learning to not struggle with is the DM not rolling, uh, in yeah. masks. One of the things that happens is the DM never rolls. Period, yeah, that's right from Apocalypse ever. World. You do not roll the dice. And mm -hmm. I am so used to wanting, um, okay, well, what's going to happen here? Hmm. I'd like something to happen here. Which of the players, is, and you know, just rolling, yep. you know, notice checks or, mm -hmm. or randomizing between players. And, and that's so built into my yeah. idea of gaming that it has been hard to pull that back. But yeah, I, I have, had a hard time with that one. Like, the, it's not the first game to do it. The first game I played that had that was Fate, which is, or not Fate, uh, Saga, Dragonlance Saga Edition was the first game I ever played that used that. And Numenera was the same thing. It was all right. player focused. Players yep. do all the rolling. And Numenera was the one I really struggled with it. Now the Dragonlance one I didn't find bad because it uses a poker-like mechanic. So players have a hand of cards in their hand mm -hmm. and they play a card based on what they're trying to do. And you just add that number to a stat to be the difficulty. And what it adds is a trump. And the trump was different depending on what you're trying to do. So you're trying to attack someone swords you got to draw a random card off the deck it's actually a brilliant system and that wasn't bad because i didn't have a hand of cards whereas everyone else did so it didn't feel weird for me not to do anything because right. i didn't have the thing to do anything whereas dice are like i should have dice where numenera <laughs> oh i just like this stupid things like i don't know which i have the 30 percent chance this happens i want to roll some dice to see if it happens because i want random things to determine what happens right the other thing i struggle with 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 powered by the apocalypse is the gm moves or the 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 knowing when to make a move myself and to note that and do it mechanically instead of just improvise as right. a dm like instead of just making stuff off the top of my head there are actual guidelines for what i should be doing based on what the narration the players are doing yeah and i find i still can't do that like my brain to, to be honest i have to say you know and, and i i i read it through a couple of times uh because i'm not i i am in very much the same way as you uh i have not structured the villains as uh moves like as, as fully fronts. as possible i have concepts for moves um, and I, so I, I am working within the guidelines, but I am not, I'm not writing out and doing hard, um, you know, I have an idea of how many conditions of, you know, this is a big bad guy. He's going to be about a four condition. I, you know, this is just some mook. He's going to be a one condition. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not codifying it hard. Uh, and I'm allowing it to things to flow a little bit with the narrative, um, mm -hmm to allow things to just be more flexible and be more fun for the players. Well, yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the fun thing. I mean, we had uh, Tuesday night, we had our second session and I had, um, you know, the first session went really well. We jumped straight into the action. I was really on, on the job when it came to a uh, visual description. I started off, I deliberately had my opening, the opening scene was as, as described was described in panels. Um, nice. Uh, and I had, I had this whole concept set for the second se session as well. And, you know, I dropped my, my block of text to let everyone know where things were, uh, two posts later, I was rapidly flipping through pages and <laughs> shuffling cards because everything had gone sideways and any thoughts I had had for possible yeah. directions we were going to go in were right out the window. Um, and I ended up creating villains on the fly, um, as we went and, and you know what, that's okay. And, and one of the things I was saying, uh, before the show, I think that I like about, uh, playing on discord is while it's sort of real time, no one knows that I'm over here massively flipping through reference materials and <laughs> tearing my hair out because the players have gone off and, you know, done what players do. Right. Uh, so do there, are there still fronts and clocks and masks or is no, that clocks that... is, uh, clocks is, um, forged in well, the, Forge in the Darkness. Well, there are clocks in Apocalypse World, too. That's, oh, okay. So uh, PBTA does have clocks. It comes from Apocalypse okay. World. But yeah, no no clocks and masks. Clocks, no fronts. Uh, fronts. I don't know fronts. Art, no. <laughs> so no. No. All right. I just said, because those are the two of the, the things I struggled with the most reading Powered by the Apocalypse. And I didn't, like, having played masks, I saw Phil use clocks. But okay. Phil plays a lot of PBTA. Well, games. yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you, clocks I could, on their own I could, work. I do clocks. Yeah, you could. I just the wonder problem, if they were built One in. of the problems with clocks and Discord is it's a pain in the butt to... Without yeah, using I would just a have specific, those on paper or something. Yeah, with, but then the players can't see them as well, right? So oh, well, yeah. in, in, in Discord, there are bots that do clocks, but I haven't 
really love them. It's one of the yeah. problems where I'm considering the next time I do this is going to be using what like will hopefully be released the 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 Forged in the Dark oh, uh yeah. game superheroes game that is I'm waiting on from Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. But again, clocks are are sort of a sticking point, but you can't get away from them in Forged by the Dark. That's yeah, that's they're, a, they're a much bigger that's, thing. That's a very big deal. Sounds good though. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Oh, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> I, I'm still trying to catch up on emails. Like, like I literally, I spent 14 days in the basement. I wasn't on my computer. I checked notifications on my phone, but I tried not to interact online. I got to admit, man, Facebook and Twitter are depressing. Like, I, I didn't miss knowing everything that was going on everywhere and all the crap going on. So that was nice. But uh, at this point, too, I'm still supposed to quarantine somewhat, at least until I'm symptom free for 24 hours. So at this point, I'm still staying away from my mom and the kids. So that's going to hamper any chances of game playing, especially with more than two players. Now, if things go perfectly, like I'm feeling better by tomorrow and everything's looking better. I'm thinking next week I'm going to try to review a couple cooperative games. So Robotech and Vid Invasion and the full review of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. I don't want to review Wonder Woman just as two player, though. I want to try it with the kids. So we'll see. That could go either way. Now, the other thing is I did have a birthday since our last recording, and I got a pile of games for that. I don't know. I don't usually get games. My mom went nuts. So I don't know if I got to unbox. This is all stuff. Okay, so we got Lindbergh, Great Western Trail, Reef, Space Base, Irish Gage, and one of the most exciting to me is finally we got a copy of the Creepy Cellar expansion for Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. I don't know where Deanna managed to find a copy of that, but that's what the kids gave me this year for my Nice. I am forward to checking. As usual, I got to unbox them. I, I just tear into them, but that's content. Come on. It'll be it'll be kind of nice getting back to playing games that are not obligation too, so that that'll be an interesting thing to see. And, and the other thing, I'm looking I forward. Got, to, sorry, I'm looking forward to Quacks of Quedlinburg. Yeah, I keep hearing good things about that one. Out of all of them, the one I'm most curious about is Space Base, to be honest, because everyone keeps telling me it's better than Valeria, and I love Valeria. So, so Space Base, we might give away a copy of Space Base too, because there was a bit of a mistake and we have two copies. We haven't decided what we're doing with the second copy yet, though. So that may or may not become something. Um, I, we do have something else to give away at some point, but we got to get things back on track. So there is a giveaway coming up at some point. It's going to be for something digital. And I, I can't even remember what right now. <laughs> Is it Scythe? It might be Scythe. I can't remember. It's a digital version of something. Anyway, uh, so that's coming. The other thing, too, is I've got one, two, three, four boxes here to open. So I invite anyone still in the chat room to stick around for the last bit of the show here. And you can watch me open up these four boxes and see what's in them. One's huge, but I know what it is. Another one, I have no clue. Like, I'm, I thought I had everything for the pile of obligation ready in here. And... It's a huge box. Like, I honestly have no clue what's going to be in that box. Um, another one people will recognize as a follow-up to something we opened, I think, the last time we recorded and were confused by. So that's a bit of a spoiler for <laughs> those people. Yeah, no, I don't uh, I don't have any real plans. Uh, so we'll we'll see what's going on. Um, you got masks happening before next week? Is it once uh, a week? Yeah, I should. In theory, we should be. We actually had to, had a cliffhanger uh, on Tuesday night, so... We're hoping to continue that up on Saturday. So more to come on that. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. William Fisher. Thank you. Danielle Thomas. Thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly of the Excellent Gaming and BS podcast, which you can also watch live here on Twitch, but Monday nights at 9 p.m., as well as some actual plays on the weekends. And I think they do a Thursday night game. He does a third. I think Sean does, does he now? I didn't see it on their schedule. I checked their schedule before mm. I did. Oh, this, it may, but... he may that may be over already. Then yeah. Andrew Dacey, thank you, and Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Well, that was the double bell. All right, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're gonna have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web and as tabletop bellhop. One word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Uh, if you like the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you headed over to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and consider tipping the bellhop.
Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.